Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, happy time zone everybody. This is Road to Dust, you can call me Road Dust for anything that you would call a friend. I am having a little bit of technical difficulties, uh, for whatever reason. My PNG, well, no, my PNG is working fine as you can see. But there's something going on with VTube Studio on my computer, or more specifically, my phone doesn't want to register that it's being plugged in so that it can be my webcam. I want to try and see if I can get this fixed, but if I can't, it's going to be another, it's going to be another uh, PNG night. I hope that's okay. Alright, let me see. Okay, now you gave me the do 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 I hope everyone is doing alright, by the way. If you can't tell, I am tired as fuck. I literally just woke up from a two hour nap because I was trying my damnedest to like stay up through the entire day because this is, uh, this was my last week um, uh, having to pull double shifts with my tutoring gig before I'm just able to throw it, toss it, like, I, I am done. Done, 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 beyond done. Okay, my VTube studio is working. I am sorry about that. I don't know why my computer crashed. Let's see if it will register my computer. Well, let's see if it will register like showing my, um, my phone. Because I have no idea why I just want to register my phone suddenly. Like... Uh, let me see if there was like an update for the app or something. I normally shouldn't be, because I don't get why all of a sudden it just doesn't want to register my phone. Is there an OS update on, on here that my phone didn't update? No. So why does it not want to connect to my phone? y'all are having a decent time though. Let me turn my my PNG back on so that y'all can see um, who y'all are talking to. So back to what I was talking about a bit ago before my computer decided to crash. Um, for those that don't know, I'm currently an ESL tutor, meaning that I teach English as a second language. I give tips on like how to improve people's English, uh, and things like that, um, and right now, um, uh, because of the company that I work with, soon to be worked with in the past tense, um, I have been working double shifts in order to attempt to have some better income, because right now, um, my trying to get, um, trying to have enough income 
for rent and bills is extremely difficult right now. Don't tell me I need to update iTunes. Apple, why do you make things so count so complicated with this? Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, right now, uh, I'm in the home stretch of working with my tutoring job. At the moment, um, it is, uh, very difficult to try and get the money I need for uh, for paying for rent and such because of the fact that my tutoring job is just not giving me enough. It's seriously
And I just realized that I have not been talking, or I have been talking about my mic was muted this entire time. Are you fucking kidding? Half hour in after two crashes, and oh, this is not my day. This is not my fucking day. Okay, the YouTube studio. There we go. Alright. So, window. YouTube studio. Let's get that situated. Oh, I need to do transparency. There we go. Jesus Christ on a fucking bicycle. I am so sorry. Wow. I'm gonna have to recap all the shit that I said in the past half hour. God ever loving fucking damn. Um, so, TLDR of what I said is that, um, I have been really struggling with, um, my tutoring job. Um, I've been basically putting myself at a, uh, 60 hour a week worth of availability. Um, but I'm not even, I'm not even getting like 20 hours worth of students. So, um, I've just been going, I'm preparing to go, fuck it. Um, I already put in my, my two weeks to where my last day is going to be the 23rd. And thankfully, I will not be doing a double shift on Sunday. Because as soon as Sunday is done, um, on Monday, I start my new job at this really cute uh, retail store that is near me. Uh, and it, this has been this has been grueling. Uh, it's been so grueling, in fact, that today, because with how the, so for a little more context on my tutoring job, while I'm going to start drawing, um, I, so, let's see, I'm trying to figure out a good way to start talking about this. I, um, work for a, so the reason why I, that there is a lot of context for, like, this job, so buckle up. We are going to be going into some story time. So, I got this job a bit out of desperation because I, um... I, I got this job a bit out of desperation, namely because I just needed a job. Because my... Um, I was living in Top Hat and his parents' place after a lot of things with us trying to move, uh, move into, like, our own place, start living independently, and start being able to live in a place where we could live as a couple, everything was going awry. Um, my flight was my flight was severely delayed by a day. Uh, the people that we wanted to live around through my own negligence as trying to be a friend completely cut me out and completely deprived us of an opportunity of wanting to live close to a community, which I do not blame them. I do not hold that against them. Um, and what was supposed to be living only a few days, if not possibly a few weeks, maybe a month max, of living under his uh, family's roof while we tried to uh, try to get things set up with our living situation, trying to find an apartment uh, or finalize the apartment and get like grocery, like our first groceries and first bits of furniture situated turned into three months of turned into three months of living under a very conservative household where we could not be ourselves due to a lot of reasons that I won't get into here um, so there's that aspect on why uh, things were just very complicated. Uh, when I 
move. I made a very ballsy move uh, for my flight because I was originally in another state. When I flew, unfortunately, I could not transfer uh, to like a different location because I was going from the west coast to the Midwest. That is a very, the north specifically, the Pacific Northwest to the Midwest. That is a massive, 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 massive um, change. That is a massive move. And the place that I uh, was working at did not have a place, did not have a location for me to transfer to within the Midwest. So, I just had to basically prepare to find a completely different job, and I thought it had a completely different job lined up. I was looking for ESL tutoring, uh, tutoring gigs because I wanted to experience how it is to uh, work from home. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, work from home jobs that I was finding, such as one that happened to be an ESL tutoring job, were very dicey. Either they were scammy, which I almost ended up being victim of a scam, or they were borderline under the table, which unfortunately the folks that I ended up working with for the past three to four months was the latter. So I do not want to name them because I don't know how that's going to be, or I don't know how that's going to make things happen. Uh, um, and, uh, Yeah, I'm trying to figure out words right now. There, there's just a lot of tea with this and a lot of stress. Um, with my current job, with my current tutoring job, I was basically told one thing and was given another. I was told, hey, we will be able to work with you. We have a lot of teachers. We have a lot of students that need help, need care. We are collaborating with a popular, with a popular and notable uh, teaching company uh, in the country where your students will be from. Um, one thing that should have thrown me off from the beginning was that they said that they were working in an under-the-table collaboration with this company because with the the country where my students were, were from uh, policies at the present time for working with multitasking really poorly with the with the company that I was working at uh, policy well so it wasn't just the company that I was working with it was a company that the company that I was working at was collaborating with I'll I'll say the former company to refer to the company that I was actually being working with and those that were paying me and I'll say the latter company for the company that was being collaborated with and that was given the assets that we could use in order to do our jobs. So, the former company and the latter company were both in cahoots with each other and they were having an under the table collaboration because um, the current um, the, the current policies in the country that I that my students were from. The current policy was that effectively um, foreign teachers should not be 
um, should not be listed for any kind of collaboration at this point. Um, namely because, um, because of how much the pandemic affected so many people with trying to, um, have, like, have jobs in an effort to try and maintain, uh, financial security for, uh, for native folks of that country, they had designed it to where in most cases, uh, foreigners could not be, uh, allowed certain jobs, which was very detrimental considering the fact that there used to be, there used to be, and arguably still is, a rather large program dedicated to, uh, ESL teachers working abroad. Now, with this policy, it makes it incredibly difficult for, uh, a, for ESL teachers coming from other countries to work in this, uh, to work in this country. And with the fact that COVID is still a thing and a lot of people are, like, self-conscious about how they interact with the world and such in a post-COVID world, it makes trying to teach or it makes trying to travel very difficult, if not nigh impossible. So a lot of international teachers appear to be in a rock and a hard place either. They go to either they go into um, online tutoring work because they uh, because trying to work in the actual country is at this point temporarily illegal and and they have to either find a reputable company that is able to work with them or they have to knowingly work with a shady company that is doing shady pra practices in order to have a job. And unfortunately, I was given the, the desperation that I needed for a job at that time. I was two months unemployed. No, no I was one month unemployed. Um, I, well, technically two, getting close to two months unemployed. I was desperate and I took this uh, other, I took this opportunity of a tutoring job. And I, at first, I was very thankful considering the fact it was like, brand new job. Um, I was not, I was employed again. I was having students. This was something that I wanted to do. But the moment that I started actually teaching, it was stressful. There was not enough communication. And to top it off, the more that the, with the lack of communication came a lot of setbacks. With the, with the lack of communication came a lot of setbacks, including but not limited to my scheduling and my pay. So with this company, um, they would tell me, all right, keep, uh, you are considered an independent contractor. You have to do, you have to monitor your own pay. You have to monitor who you are teaching. And basically you will give an invoice to us uh, by the end of the month and you will be paid uh, at the halfway point of next month. Sounds good? Well, unfortunately, you couldn't really plan ahead for, uh, like, what your pay was going to be or how many students you were going to have because 
students can postpone and such. And sometimes, um, students will be suddenly taken off of your schedule. Oh. My alert. Uh. I. It probably was working, Celine, but I did recently deal with, um, a good chunk of OBS crashes. So I don't know if that kind of fudged things over. Back to my story. With my, uh, with my job at the time, um, it was just incredibly, incredibly shady. And unfortunately, I felt very much taken advantage of, of the fact that I needed employment, I needed a job, and the, the folks of this company were giving me white lies, were giving me uh, information that they knew would entice me, but were not actually going to commit. For example, giving me a consistent enough of pay that I was going to make what I needed for rent and then some. These past four months that I've been working with this company, no month, including this month, where I am working double shifts and having 60 hours worth of on-call availability, have I received enough pay to safely pay for my rent, my utilities, my personal bills, my groceries. I have not had enough saved for any of that. Within the past four months, I have had to regularly go into savings or have had to rely on my fiance who makes, a, who makes double what I make when I was working with this company quadruple in order for us to maintain our house. To make, well, not our house, our apartment. So, I have had to put in my two weeks with this company. Thankfully, after finding another job. I'm not going unemployed again. I have another job set up. And I'm going to be starting with this new job uh, on the... Uh, 24th, and I am beyond excited and beyond relief because I have been way too stressed out with this too. Congratulations for the new job. Thank you, thank you, Kane, uh, Kane and Eve. But yeah, you, I don't know when you guys hopped in, uh, during this whole, sh during this whole story time spiel. But I've been, I, I've been airing out my dirty laundry, honestly, without, without uh, naming the company uh, that I used, that I currently work for and technically will not be working for starting, um, the starting Monday, uh, which I am just ecstatic for. Uh, this company unfortunately just the, the best way that I can phrase it was just took advantage of me when I needed employment and now that um, now that um, sorry Words are also complicated right now. Now that I am uh, able to find a better job, what's even more aggravating is the fact of how many times that they have attempted to pressure me to stay with them. Um, which I find funny, because either this means that they do not have enough teachers to accommodate for the amount of students that they have, which is quite surprising considering the fact that they don't have enough students to 
give one of their teachers enough pay to where they can afford rent that they, they don't have enough pay to give someone based a living wage, but um, they also don't have enough students for the company that they are collaborating with, so I, I, I saw the writing on the wall when I got all the pieces together, and I knew that I needed to leave. I knew that I, I, I needed to leave that there is no way that I could stick with this company knowing that they were already doing things under the table because the law in their in the, the country of the latter company was that they were going against the law of their own country which had temporarily uh, made, made massive restrictions against um, foreign uh, foreign folks are coming into the country for jobs because the uh, the folks behind uh, Parliament for this country uh, were extremely concerned for the financial security of folks of their country, which is understandable. It's a little annoying, uh, especially when you are wanting to be an ESL tutor. And, mo and most popular opportunities tend to be studying abroad or working online for, uh, for the sake of students in that country. Now, it's not very easy to do that. So unfortunately, the next best thing that can be done is to participate in an, un in, in an under the table uh, company collaboration, which even then, me knowing this information, I was not given, like, all of this information transparently. Which, for one, understandable on the company, because, like, admitting that you were doing something hella shady is not the best look when you're trying to recruit uh, new tutors. At the same time, the fact that they were basically going against the law of the country that they were participating with or they were going against the law of a con the, the laws of a country that they were trying to participate in for their work and all the same probably because of the fact that they were doing su such shady work they couldn't have a lot of students. They had to lie to... They had to lie on a lot of levels that they um, likely could not have as many students as they wanted to tell the teachers. So, the, the, this is now going into speculatory territory, so bear with me. Um, so, effectively, what happened was that everyone was being hoodwinked. Well, the students were being hoodwinked, and teachers especially, uh, especially those in my case that were desperate for income, were being hood hoodwinked. A lot of us were being told, oh yeah, if you can only do, like, uh, part-time, um, like, you are totally okay, uh, just be sure to tell us, like, your income limit, and we will be sure to give you the amount of students, uh, that will not put you in detriment, uh, of anything like that. But, again, when I said that I needed to fit a certain income limit because I was trying to have state health care because... State health care uh, covers a lot more typically compared to uh, premiums uh, for health care. Um, again, they only gave me, like, to, to put relative numbers, there was only one month where I made 850 Every other month that I worked with this company, I made less than that. For four months, I have made under 
$900 a month, excluding taxes. When, like, that that is no way to safely have enough rent to afford anything. I could barely uh, have enough for my, uh, for my rent and, and my bills. I could not have money for anything else. I was scraping by beyond scraping by. And there were some months where I made under the amount that I needed for my rent. And I would have to pull money out of savings or my fiance, Top Hat, absolute fucking sweetheart and an absolute chad, like give, give respects to Top Hat with this, with how much that he's been having to endure with this as well would have to, like, help pay for my end of what my part of rent and bills was supposed to be. And, again, I, I will say this again. He made, on av based on the average amount of money that I made with this tutoring company, he made quadruple what I made as a delivery boy compared to what I was supposed to make as a tutor. So, needless to say, I, I'm not sure when I am going to like make some post, if I want to make a post, um, either on Reddit or whatever about this particular company, but I am never going to recommend this company to anyone who's trying to get their foot in the door as an ESL tutor. They are absolutely repugnant. The lack of transparency, the lack of communication, and the adamant pressure to stay, despite the fact that they would not give proper accommodations and proper income to their tutors, is just a massive reason on why I will not be working with them anymore and why I am beyond thankful that starting Monday, I will not have to work with them anymore. That said, with my change in job, that does mean that we are going to start, on a happier note, having schedule cards. Uh, for those that want uh, in the Discord server, those that check on my Twitter, you will see weekly updates on my schedule cards where you will see what I'm going to be uh, doing for the week. Um, for This is going to start um, this coming Sunday, the 23rd, uh, and we'll be going from there with, um, yeah, sorry. My brain is also semi-fried because of th this job, this tutoring job, has just been a, an absolute fucking shit show. This month, I have been doing um, basically double shift open availability for students. Like, basically making myself open for 60 hours worth of availability and I have not been getting even 20 hours worth of students for 60 hours worth of availability I have been getting little sleep throughout this entire fucking month to accommodate for this open availability the 60 hour worth availability and at the end of my working with them for three weeks today, well, today, this week, Sunday, whatever, I am only going to be making 700 before tax. So yeah, I, there are so many emotions right now, and also I am borderline delirious considering the fact that, again, not a lot of sleep lately, and I literally woke up 15 minutes before my uh, my countdown was supposed to go, and I've already been pretty peeved today considering the fact that I have had two OBS crashes. 
Ay, 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 ay. But yeah. <laughs> I love how I've been just blabbering about, like, saying fuck you to my current job. Uh, because I'll be able to start my new job soon for, like, the past half hour. Uh, how is everyone doing? <laughs> I, I do uh, want to, like, say thank you to you guys for letting me just go off. get it. I, I totally get it. Sometimes, like, talking with a streamer can be intimidating, or you got your own stuff going on. You might be working, which, congrats to you. Make that money. how tired I am. I did not even realize that I was doing, I was drawing on the same layer as the hat.
for tomorrow's uh, gaming stream. Um, I'm a little curious about possibly getting into Phasmo again. It's been a long time since I played Phasmo. The last time that I played it was actually with Almond, like all the way back in June? Yeah, it had to have been June. Either June or July. Um, how would y'all like to see a Phasmo stream? Either solo or with friends. not to be seen on my tablet. I hope that's okay. I hope everyone is doing well, by the way. This whole week has been very stressful. I really hope that everyone is doing well, though. I really appreciate you guys hopping in. Uh, for those that are like new to my stuff, uh, sorry you're not seeing my tablet right now, but there's a reason for that. But hi, uh, I am Rosa Dusk. You can call me Ro Dusk. Uh, anything that you would call a friend. I am a um, I am a um, flipping variety streamer that does a lot of drawing and gaming. Um, currently, I am drawing uh, a friend and a uh, fellow uh, VTuber, asterisk of asterisks official, if I can talk. Um, she is an amazing person, our resident wholesome degenerate, emphasis on the hoe, her words, not mine, um, who loves to um, just have, she just loves to have fun and just be an absolute sweetheart while also unapologetically just being horny on me. Um, I highly recommend that you look at her content. Um, can we, uh, for one of my mods uh, that is in that is in chat right now. Can we get a shout out for Lexi, if possible? Uh, I don't know how bad the lag is, but I will do it myself just in case. Oh, that didn't work. So, there we go. There we go. Yeah, so, Asterix Official, aka Lexi Flair. So, please be sure to give her some love. Please note that, like my streams, uh, her content is 18+. plus. But, um, she is a very nice person. I highly recommend uh, her content. She, she is a sweetheart. Uh, she is very fun to be around, and I, I highly recommend her. She, she makes very great company. Uh, currently for this Halloween. 
she is dressed up as... Melissa in training, thank you so much for the follow. Oh. Melissa in training, Melissa! Hey hon, how you doing? Um, I know I am like streaming right now, but let me know if you still need help getting into my Discord server. Um, try to let me know when you have hopped in, um, and I will direct you to all the stuff that you need to get yourself situated. Um, I know that everything in there, that the layout is unfortunately still not very um, visually impaired friendly so please let me know how I can help you out to get yourself set up and verified in my server We're now at 99 fold. Can we get to 100? Can we get to 100? <laughs> If we get to 100 by the end of tonight's stream, I am... If we get to 100 followers on Twitch before the end of stream, I will give my lore early. It's originally supposed to be uh Leatriel Tempest. Oh my god. Has hopped in with five raiders. <laughs> Leatriel <laughs> Tempest just raided the channel with five viewers. Leatriel, thanks so much for uh, the raid. How are things? Uh, what did you play? For those that do not know me, I will go through my little intro. Hi, my name is Road to Dusk. You can call me Road Dusk, anything that you call a friend. Uh, I do a lot of variety content such as drawing as you can see here as well as gaming um i am planning a uh lore drop uh stream on the <laughs> i am i'm sorry about the ads mate um i am planning a um lore drop stream on the 29th um and Sorry, I am struggling with words right now. Uh, but I am... Yeah, I'm wanting to do... I'm wanting to do that. If I can fucking talk. Uh, please know that my streams are 18 plus so that I can get away with talking shit. Um, I am planning for my Lord Drop stream to be a community night. So it will be a lot of games like Jackbox, like Use Your Words, uh, Among Us... Uh, games like that. Um, if it will work, maybe I'll even do VR chat and have a VR room for people to talk. Just be sure that since it, it, it will be a community night, please know to follow uh, Twitch TOS and TOS of everything that we're going to be using. Um, but yeah, um, currently I've been trying to do a lot of like Halloween or scary games. Um, if that sounds like your cup of tea, please feel free to stick around. I'd appreciate the company. Also, I'm glad you're back, Lightrail. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. How long... How many ads did you get, dude?
Raiden underscore VT. Thank you so much for the Raiden! follow. Thank you so much for the follow. And holy shit, we got to 100. Okay. I said if we got to 100. Sean and Serena, was... <laughs> thank you so much for the follow. Serena, thanks so much for the follow. And holy shit, I said that if we got to 100, that I was going to drop my lore early. So, <laughs> it looks like the 29th is just going to be a normal... Um, it looks like... Uh... Only then I realized I haven't followed you yet. <laughs> I follow her goal. Because uh, I, I did say right at the... Just before you came in, uh, Lytreal, I did say that if I was going to hit 100 uh, followers here on Twitch before the end of stream, I was going to drop my lore early. The 29th was supposed to be the, the stream where we do the lore drop. Not anymore! It's going to be coming in tomorrow. <laughs> So y'all, y'all better be happy with yourselves about that. I, I am excited. Like I'm really proud of my lore because it incorporates a little bit of like my, uh, a little bit of like my con lane stuff, which I, I love me making like con lanes or world building. Comes with being uh, a, uh, a a DM for like Dungeons and Dragons stuff. So yeah, get ready for that, because y'all are getting a nice little reward tomorrow. On top of, like, tomorrow being, like, a, a normal gaming stream, you're going to get a little bit of a uh, little bit of a story time with my lore. And I am super excited to bring that to you guys. Also, um... For anyone that wants to join my server, like, my voice chat is open right now. Um, and so I would appreciate you, like, coming to my Discord, and if you want to join in the conversation, you're more than open to hop in. Please know that when you do hop in my Discord server, you have to go to the rules, and you have to click on a little thumbs up emote, and read the rules, be sure that you verify, because the clicking the thumbs up means that you have verified yourself that you have read the rules. I have this uh, to stop any bots uh, from staying in the server for too, well, unwanted bots, I should say, from being in the server for too long, because if you do not uh, click on, if you do not uh, verify that you've read the rules within 10 minutes, you will be booted. You have the opportunity to hop in again and try again, but um, yeah, there, there is that safety thing. Um, please know that my server, like my streams, are easy plus. So if you are under 18, no touchy. No touchy. I, I may seem like I'll say so and whatnot right now, uh, namely because of like how I look and whatnot, but Nah, I ain't say so. Also, hey, Kenny! How's it going? I'm... <clears throat> Didn't realize it was Friday until my dad called me and I'm going to my cousin's uh, home, uh, welcome home party because he just bought a house. Well, hey, that's kind of nice. Yeah, he got surprisingly cheap, too, because from what I understand, it takes seven people to buy a house. Yeah. And to that, I say monogamy in this economy. Right? Preach. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, after last week was a rough one. I won't go into detail, but I've had two good days, counting today. The the, the feeling is mutual. I was airing out my dirty laundry for like a half hour earlier about my tutoring job. Because <laughs> they've been really fucking me over this month. I understand. Uh, T TLDR uh, for that and for those that are just hopping into my stream. Um, I basically opened up my availability this month for double shifts, which equate to like 60 hours a week worth of availability. 
I haven't been getting... Like, I have been lucky to get 20 hours worth of students in one week. I have not been making enough with this uh, with this company for months to like even have a chance of making enough income to safely cover my bills. So, yeah, I'm not going to be working with uh, this place anymore. Because they have been really stressing me out and driving me nuts. My sleep schedule has been really screwed up. I really haven't had a lot of time to interact with people without severely uh, putting my physical health in jeopardy. And yeah, I'm just done. Thankfully, I'm not going to be... Uh, thankfully, I'm not like quitting the job without a plan. I do have a... I do have uh, a new job that I'm going to be starting on Monday, which means for everyone here, uh, you get to see some new fancy schmancy schedule cards. So at least there's that. <laughs> I just popped into your stream and I just, yeah, I was about to say my uh, icon was... Yeah, you're a little on the B side. I was honest. I kept you beak for a bit because I didn't know if like other people were gonna hop in or not. But yeah. Also, uh, because we hit a uh, hundred followers uh, today. Uh, let's see. Since we hit a uh, hundred followers uh, before the end of stream today, I am going to be dropping my lore early. You guys are going to get that tomorrow, not next week. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, I'm just checking my online games for dailies. Yeah, yeah. I was playing a game of uh, Dead by Daylight earlier. Mm. How has Dead Light, how has DBD been lately? Um, let's just say that learning curve got steeper. Uh, elaborate. I have. Uh, so tell, tell me, like I'm five. I have. N I've seen people play Dead by Daylight. I have never played it personally, so I really don't understand the mechanics. So, gameplay-wise, I mean, I can go on and on about the lore, but gameplay-wise, one person is the killer, and the killers are obviously, like, horror movie killers, or killers from the Dead by Daylight multiverse, right. who each have some kind of tool or a power to um, <clears throat> hinder or kill other survivors. So, like, I'll give you an example. The first three killers were the Trapper, the Hillbilly, and the Wraith. Uh, Trapper, he's sort of like your typical Jason-like character. He's got a weird mask. He's got, like, railroad spikes sticking out of his shoulders, and he lays down bear traps all over the place. Mm. Now, he is a pain to deal with on certain maps because he can hide bear traps in, like, tall grass and, like, loops and stuff. So unless you can, like, see them, it'll be very hard when he's, like, chasing you and you accidentally run into a trap and he gets you. Hmm. Um, Hillbilly is is sort of like a weird parody of Leatherface who was added later to the game. Like, how later? A couple years afterwards. Oh, dang. How long has Dead, like, Dead by Daylight been around? Since 2016. Damn. A lot longer than I yeah. thought. 
it just it's slowly gotten more popular over time so it sounds so, like the, the popularity is declining a bit lately. No, it's, it's, it's weird. Some people are leaving it because of the changes. But some people are going into it because, ooh, ooh cool uh, horror game. Right. I mean, they just added another Resident Evil chapter where the killer is Wesker and the survivors are Rebecca Chambers and Ada Wong. Ooh. Oh, wait, yeah. Didn't they have uh, Leon? For a while? Um, they had Leon, they still have Leon and Jill. Oh. Well, so and the killer for me. them was Nemesis. I'm gonna change my music to something a little more spooky. But, um, the thing is, in the game, the survivors all have. When you look at survivors, they play all the same. Their main deal is. They heal. They can heal each other. Unhook other survivors. Mm -hmm. um, interact with uh, hooks and objects and fix generators. Because you have to repair five generators to open the main gate hmm. to escape the killer. Okay. But what makes survivors unique is their unique perks. Because every, every like just, just like the killers, unique perks, survivors perks too. So, for example, um, I'll go with one of the first survivors they had to the game. There was a character named Claudette, and she, her story is she was a botanist who got lost in the woods. So her perks revolve around healing. So she's got self-care where she can heal herself without using a med kit. And I'll talk about self-care in a second, because that's one of the biggest changes. Uh oh. Was it nerfed? Uh, if you said anything, I didn't hear you. Was it nerfed? It was significantly nerfed. Originally, you can heal yourself without a med kit for at 50% the healing speed. Now it's up to 35% healing speed. Oh, wow. So you'll basically be sitting there for hours. And it's even more of a pain with some of the uh, killer perks that make you slower at healing. Oh, dang. That sounds... that sounds stressful. Very much so, but here's the thing. I didn't realize this until I started... ...fiddling around with other perks. I was using self-care as a crutch. Mm. Because... When another survivor heals you, it's significantly faster. Oh. So I'm like, if I'm working with a good teammate or bring a med kit, then I'm good. Um, but the other perks Claudette had were one that also increased your healing speed, but it reduced your item efficiency. And I think her last one was increase. Uh, I think it was empathy or something. Empathy, I forget what it does, but it is a healing perk. Sounds like, um, based on like what I think for like the word like empathy, sounds like uh, like a buff when it comes to healing other folks. Yeah, come to think of it. I never really see anyone run Empathy because there's a perk called Aftercare. And what that perk does is it allows you to see the auras of people that you heal. Huh. So I guess it's kind of like Empathy, but better. And more team-oriented. Mm. Then you'll have some very unique perks. Like, every Resident Evil character has some self-defense perk. Or some perk that makes it easier for your whole team. Cool. So, Leon has the perk Flashbang, and what what, what Flashbang is, is if you repair a generator up to 66%, you can go into a locker empty-handed. 
SWFS asterisk. And you can craft a flashbang, which can be used to stun and blind the killer. Mm. Also, uh, Lectrio Temples just said, love destroying stabs at, uh, as a death slinger, then they nerfed him to hell. Oh, SWS. What is SWS? Uh, survive with friends. So it's kind of like... Uh. I usually do solo queue because I don't have many friends who play the game, or if I do, they're usually busy. <laughs> and I am shy as hell meeting new people. That That is a mood. That's understandable. Um... Let's see, what's... Uh... Jill has a very fun perk, if you like to mess with the killer. Can you explain it to me? If you repair a generator halfway, you can put a flat blast mine in the generator, so when the killer kicks it, it won't lose its pr uh, progress, and it blinds the killer just like Flashbang. Oh, that sounds gnarly. The th thing with blinding killers in Dead by Daylight is, if they're carrying a survivor, if they're blinded, it stuns them and they drop their survivor so they can get away. Um, but of course, there is a killer perk that makes it impossible to blind them. Oh, wow. But, you know, there is, there, it's not, it's not a necessary perk. Like, you can, if you can, just try to look away from whenever they're shining a flashlight. <laughs> right. That's what I did as, uh, when I played Pyramid Head at one point. Ooh, oh, they had a Silent Hill pack? Mm-hmm. Though, there is one thing that did confuse me about it. That being? The only survive, The only monster they had was Pyramid Head. I was kind of hoping they would maybe have a cosmetic that made him the Butcher from Silent Hill Origins. Who I like to call Diet Pyramid Head, because same general idea with right. him. Especially I know I'll probably symbolism. I um I probably get crucified for saying that, but you look at the butcher and then you look at Pyramid Head and they're kind of similar in their meaning and also the fact that they're big monstrous men with big kitchenware as weapons and a metal mask. Right. I mean, aren't some people also a little miffed in the community because the butcher has so many similar qualities to Pyramid Head? <sighs> A little bit, but I hardly ever hear anyone talk about the butcher. But the, what confused me the most in this pack is the survivor was Cheryl Mason, who was in no way associated with Pyramid Head, except in the movies. And they went with the game design for both of them. Of course, they did add a cosmetic pack for uh, Cheryl, so you can make her look like James from Silent Hill 2, or Sybil from Silent Hill 1, or even Alessa, who I really don't think should be a survivor. Mm, why is that? Alessa is the reason why Silent Hill is, well, part of the reason why Silent Hill is cursed. She was like the final nail in the coffin that cursed the town. Basically, the town was built on a... According to the lore, the town was okay, built on I a sacred Native American site. Okay, oh, Melissa! Hey, glad to have you in chat, hon. Sorry. But um, a lot of bad things happened in that area, so it kind of pissed off the uh, spirits that were there. And the death of a girl considered a witch, who actually did have some crazy psychic powers, kind of the final nail in the coffin that kind of threw the town into a literal and figurative hell. Well. Yeah, let's just say I have encyclopedic knowledge in very obscure games like this. <laughs> I mean, you do you, dude, as long as you're having fun. As long as you're not, like, one of those dudes that's, like, as long as you're not, like, using the knowledge that you have of the games that you like to, like, gatekeep other people, saying that they're not good enough of fans. Like, I'm- I'm Gucci. 
the only thing I will say about Silent Hill as a series, because I know some some people say that Silent Hill fans gatekeep the games, is there's a little kernel of truth when they say some of the newer games do suck, and this is from experience. Hmm. I mean, there, there's but, a difference between acknowledging that games are are made poorly and people just saying like, oh, a game just sucks because they don't like it. Like, there, there's a Thanks, glad to finally have a night to myself. Like, I'll don't let me give you an example. It, Homecoming, Busy which was the first Silent Hill game LOL. I played. I know, I'm, I know, it's such a horrible thing. Hmm. <laughs> Homecoming was sort of like Silent Hill, the movie, the game. <laughs> oh. Except the story was different, and I will say the there's only there's four bosses, and each boss is annoying as hell. Hmm. So, and I can, I even, I can even break down mathematically how bad the bosses are. Damn. The first boss, which is called Sephliker, it's the biggest boss in the game. It only has 200 hit points. So, realistically, it's a fairly weak boss. Hmm. Also, Melissa, the totally under, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, dude. Sorry. Uh, Melissa, totally understandable. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to, like, hop in. Like, uh, for context, like, Kenny, like, I know Melissa, like, IRL. Break a leg, hon. I know you're going to kick ass. All right, you're good. <laughs> All right. The second boss is, honestly, this is just the most frustrating part of Homecoming. Between, um, the- because after being Sephlicker, your character gets knocked out and wakes up in the, uh, wakes up in a jail cell. Hmm. You, you have to fight these monsters called Schisms throughout the county jail. Damn. I call them pendulum heads You're because that's what their heads look like. They look like weird, meaty pendulums. So, like a hammerhead shark, or but like with a a scoliosis. Phallic. Oh no, it does not look phallic at all. Though I know some, <laughs> I know some Silent Hill monsters do have that uh, very sus look to them. Look, I mean, in one of the first Persona games, we literally had a final boss that was a giant penis, a penis centipede. on a chariot. <laughs> I remember Mara. <laughs> <laughs> but look, um, I will tell you right now, there is some Silent Hill parodies on YouTube that are comedy gold. And one of the biggest running jokes in them is like, I don't understand why these monsters look like ex-genitals. I don't think about it that much. Thank all that's holy. My streams are 18 plus. <laughs> In all seriousness, <laughs> sorry, I just can't. Every time someone talks about Silent Hill with me, they always bring up how a monster looks like a body. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, am I wrong though? You're not. That's not. That's the worst part. <laughs> but anyway, from the police station level. Uh, there's a boss, there's a mini boss towards the end. Um, one of my favorite monsters is called Siam. Mm. It's like part of it's one giant big hulking monster, and on its back is strapped some woman like creature. So, wait, Siam as in like Siamese, as in, as in like Siamese twins? Now that you mention it, I never realized that until now. It's so it is kind of like that. This is what happens when you're around someone whose special interest is languages. Um, but yeah, then after that, you go through the sewers. The sewers are annoying because there's you're constantly getting in fights with weird little monsters, and then you're running low on healing supplies because they're stretched mm -hmm. far and thin. They fight another Siam towards the end. Mm. 
And then after that, you have to go through the streets of Silent Hill, dealing with dog monsters and the weird armless guys, except these guys spew smoke. Oh. Yeah, it's basically the armless figure, except it's uh, got a weird burning look to it. Ooh. It's a bit of a fleshy look to it. But the, uh, yeah, you got to go to a doctor's office. Um, you enter the other world in the doctor's office, and towards the end of that other world, because surprise, surprise, you only fight two monsters there. Hmm. At the end of it is the most annoying part of the game, because you face the second boss, who is a giant spider doll creature named Scarlet. You want to know how terrible Scarlet is? Lay it on me. Someone to explain to me why they gave this is the only enemy in the game with a thousand hit points. Wow. The final boss of the game only has 510 hit points. There was no reason for a boss this difficult. Was Scarlet meant to be like a secret boss or something? No. She is a main story boss. She is a main story boss with more hit points than, than the final boss. Yeah. Wow. wow. They just wanted to put in something that it makes your heart really palpitate because the more you damage her, and this is a really... I, I do like this boss stylistically mm. because detail-wise, she's amazing. The more you damage her, the faster she gets because her skin is made of porcelain oh. all musty and stuff so the more you damage her the more spider-like she becomes oh okay that's creative see from an artistic perspective homecoming was amazing but from a story and gameplay perspective sounds like it was kind of shit <laughs> that's putting it politely <laughs> You can play the game through a second playthrough, though. I don't know why you would be so masochistic, masochistic as to do that. <laughs> I, I I thought of doing it. I even started, and I just gave, I just gave up. I'm like, I'm not doing this. Hmm. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I stayed up until the birds were chirping, fighting Scarlet. Wow. In one That's run. how. I, I got pissed off. I took a break and came back an hour later when I wind, winded down. Fair. I was so infuriated. No, and I finally Holy shit. finally beat that boss. And I was actually happy. I did beat the game, though, and I got the most neutral ending you could get. Because I felt like it was the ending that made sense. What is considered the true ending? If you don't mind me asking for spoilers. It's very hard to tell, to be honest. Because every Silent Hill game, some people would say the bad endings are always the true ending. But I'm hardwired to try to be a good person in games, so I usually try to go for the good ending first. Mm. Well, so in Homecoming, yeah, what's the, the, uh, on the good ending? The good ending is... The main character finally comes to realize what he did and is able to live happier. Hold on, I, I want to double check on that because I remember yeah. four endings. One of them was he's in an asylum and basically goes through electroshock therapy in one of the, one of the rooms, which apparently the number 206 is significant in this game because that's the room... A cert in the beginning of the game, it's like a weird dream sequence, and there's so much stuff about uh, up the patient that's in room 206, room 206, and you find out that you were that patient in that oh. dream. And every clock in town stops at exactly 206. So it's kind of like pointing in that direction, like, this, is, this might be the true ending. But it doesn't make sense, though, because the doctor who was doing it was his dad, who 
dies in the game. <laughs> I mean, it could be like a The Darkness situation, where it's like, it's slightly hallucinatory. Because like, remember how in The Darkness 2, um, the big um, hallucination that's conjured is that you are in an insane asylum, and the love of your life is one of the RNs there? Yeah, honestly, that's the one thing I hated about The Darkness 2, because I, rem I played The Darkness 1. I hell, I still have it on my Xbox. And whenever your character, quote unquote, died when his body was being put, put back together, he went to a weird other world inside the darkness that was a recreation of World War One, where German soldiers were demons and the allied soldiers, including his grandpa, were just people who were victims of the darkness fighting an unwinnable battle. I like that one because it was cool and you had to eat the hearts of your enemies to keep them from getting back up. Oh, dang. But also, I like games from back then that had really, really scary creature design. You look at the demon soldiers in the Darkness 1, and they were all freaky. You can barely see their faces in the game. Mm. Unless you get, like, up close. And it's like the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> But The Darkness 2, I really hated that ending where you actually go to hell to save your girlfriend, and then she turns out to be to, the darkness. To be the vessel of the Angulus. Yeah, and then you're just stuck there forever? That 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 was kind of a middle finger, because we haven't gotten a darkness game in forever. Like, I, I don't believe that's the true end to Jackie Astakata right there. Yeah, it really does feel a bit like a cop-out, not thinking about it. I feel like they were anticipating having a third game, but it's just never happened. I mean, they got both of the games backwards compatible on uh, Xbox One and Xbox Series X. So maybe we'll get something if enough people play those games, but... I ain't counting on it. Yeah. Okay, I'm um, on the Silent Hill wiki right now, and I'm looking towards the endings. Ooh, okay. Great. The good ending is called Smile, where the main character beats the final boss and apologizes to his brother, who is the reason his, his he's sort of the reason his brother is dead but he thinks his brother is missing oh. basically just he leaves town with the girl he likes and there's a bonus scene where if you collect all 11 photos or beat the game in hard you get a special thing where uh, I guess it's sort of like a weird happy ending where his brother uh just snaps a pitch right when he walks into his room. Hmm. Like, I think it's like the one good memory he had with his brother. Aww. Yeah, it's kind of... Yeah. Um, the, There's a bad ending where the main character's dad basically uh, kills him. Because the weird thing is in the town that the ga this game takes place in, because it doesn't take place in Silent Hill. Well, the second half of the game takes place in Silent Hill. But the first half, it's a town called Shepherd's Glen, and the whole thing with that town is they were all, the people who founded it were all cultists from Silent Hill, and they had to make a pact with some of the old gods in Silent Hill, basically saying, yet they had to kill their firstborn kids to appease them. And... The main character, Alex, sort of. 
I'm not going to go into detail with how each Force Firstborn died, and basically their ghosts become the uh, bosses in the game, but I'm not going to go into detail because it's a little too much even for me. I don't like kids, but I also don't like hearing about kids dying. Right. But basically, the bad ending is where his dad kills him to appease the old gods. The really bad ending is where the main character, Alex, becomes a new pyramid head. Hey, yo. How does that I, happen? I don't know. I, I guess it's sort of like treated as the uh, spirits of Silent Hill are turning you into their quote-unquote judges as penance for your uh, sins or something. I don't know. I find it interesting how they would turn into specifically pyramid, the pyramid head though, because at least, so, well, because like with uh, Silent Hill one, and this is also coming from someone who has only seen folks play Silent Hill. I've never actually played it myself as much as I want to. So correct me, like feel free to correct me if I'm saying anything that's wrong compared to Lord. Uh, but from what I gather with Silent Hill 1, um, all of the people that we see, all the manifestations that we see, Pyramid Head, the nurse, all of that jazz, are meant to be specific to that one individual. Silent Hill is not necessarily, or at least wasn't, uh, its own kind of place where you have mobs or monsters of like the same kind. It's meant to be... In, it's meant to be feeding off of the internal turmoil of every individual. Everyone is in their own personal hell. Meaning, Pyramid Head, the nurse, and everything like that are all connected to each individual. So how can there be a Pyramid Head for other people? So, um, you're correct on that. But there's one issue with it. Okay. Head was never in Silent Hill 1. He only showed up in Silent Hill 2. Wasn't in 3. Showed up in Origins and... That was about it. Um, Any other sense of Pyramid Head is uh, usually in the game's source code. Just like a little Easter egg. Ah. Uh, I see. Um... This is a bullshit explanation what I'm about to give, but my explanation for why I... This is just what I believe is why Pyramid Head is in Homecoming is because the way I see it, when someone goes to Silent Hill, their personal turmoil, trauma, issue, whatever, manifests as a monster because of the spirits there. Mm. So, if you look at certain monsters... They represent certain things, and certain monsters that represent very similar things have similar traits. So anything with like repressed trauma or guilt usually has some kind of metallic aspect to its body, while some monsters with a more that represent something more sexual or very phallic or think bubblehead nurses. Mm. The nurses, um, because I'm, I'm going to be honest, this is going to sound so weird, but most Silent Hill characters have some form of sexual frustration, which is why you see uh, the bubblehead nurses in most games. It sounds so Jungian. It, it does. Like, I thought but... I already dealt with enough of Jungian psychology with the, with the major and minor arcana in the Persona series. Yeah, but my theory for why Pyramid Head is there is because while it's not exactly the same, the trauma that Alex feels is the same, is similar to the trauma that James Sunderland felt. It's a repressed guilt for being the cause of somebody's death. Mm. Which, it makes sense to me, but I know some people say it's bullshit because the creative designer of the game said, oh, this character Oh, no, he's only specific to James. But 
I do want to point out that you do see a monster in Silent Hill 2 that is specific to one person, which by that logic means nobody else would be able to see this monster except that person. Mm. And that person was... In the strategy guide, it's called the uh, Doorman, but it's actually called the Abstract Daddy, which is... It looks like a coffee table with two humanoid figures tied to it. Oh, okay. I'm not going to say what it represents because it's that bad, but let's just say it is the most egregiously disgusting thing from Silent Hill 2, and this is this is coming from someone who's seen some shit in the Silent Hill series. Damn, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Every monster with some metallic aspect to it is, in some way, related to guilt. Hmm. So, how would you explain then someone becoming a monster? Or becoming like a pyramid head or something like that? How, how does that come into play? Well... I should I should say this that ending is not canon. Mm, okay. It is not canon, but if it were, I would inter because they don't really do a good job of explaining stuff. This is a game where you have to try to interpret stuff for yourself. Okay. Becoming a monster like that, I would interpret as the ultimate form of punishment in Silent Hill. Like, you committed something horrible, now you have to be the judge for people who have done similar things. Mm. And it sort of makes me think of Pyramid Head, because Pyramid Head was... Like I said, he represented James' suppressed guilt. Mm. But it's also sort of like representing James judging himself for killing his mo his uh, wife and not accepting it. Hmm. So now it's up to his wife's ghosts to sort of either condemn or forgive him, depending on his actions throughout the game. Which I find that, like, interesting because how much do you know about, like, the uh, like, the Japanese and Shinto concept of, like, Oni and Yokai? Um, I, I'm gonna be honest, probably surface level knowledge, but I do know that the whole thing with S Silent Hill is they tried to mix Western and Japanese horror together and it made something that, to me, this is gonna sound weird, but it's beautiful in a way that you, it puts a lot of thought into it while also giving you that sense of horror you wanted to see in a game like this. Yeah, the reason why I, I asked that is that, um, in Shinto with the concept of yokai which is like the modern name for like the oni the oni used oni used to be a catch-all term for all uh, malevolent beings in shinto now it's been uh now that's shifted to yokai yokai used to be a more specific term yokai uh so there is a thing very similar to um greek paganism or hellenism uh, known as miasma, which is basically like a spiritual uncleanliness. In Shinto, it's called kegare. Um, one of the things uh, that defines uh, an oni or a yokai is not not just um, a uh, not just like an abundance of kegare, but also more specifically a loss of humanity. Which, if you know, like, Demon Slayer, you see this, like, pretty vehemently. You see all these uh, Oni that uh, Tanjiro and everyone has to go against, but we have very tragic stories of all these people losing their humanity due to traumatic experiences. That is very prevalent within Shinto. Like, yokai are people who lost their humanity and became monstrous. So, with this 
frankly, non-canon, but with this ending in Silent Hill, can we not then interpret that maybe within, like, the idea of, like, having to be one's own Punisher, is that not then losing your humanity, losing your morality, and becoming what you hated? Huh? Actually, I think that's the most perfect interpretation of some of an ending like this. Um, it's also funny that you mentioned the loss of humanity when it comes to Oni, because that's all one of the monster, one of the killers in Dead by Daylight is literally an Oni. <laughs> nice. But his story was he was a a really big guy who um because of his appearance people called him an oni and it sort of pissed him off but he would you know go around defending villages and stuff until they became mistrustful of him and tried to attack him so he just destroyed the entire village yeah i i think that that might be partly because of the western uh assumption or like the the combining of the concept of the Oni and the Ogre. Because Oni now is a more specific term to describe uh, these really large, kind of bumbling kind of yokai that in like the interpretations of, of mythology and mythical creatures and monsters that we have in the West look pretty, like, are probably the closest to an Ogre as you can get. But, um, that correlation uh, doesn't really explain Oni well enough. Like, it, it's a decent correlation, similar to, like, how um, in Korean mythology there is a creature called, called a Dokkebi, um, and in the West we tend to equate it to, like, the quote-unquote Korean goblin, but one, Dokkebi are not anti-Semitic in nature, and two, uh, they have a very different and more malevolent side to them compared to goblins in the West. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh yeah, goblins are anti-Semitic as fuck. Is it because of the uh, usual tropes of the big noses and the greed? Yep, yep. I am so glad that when it comes to goblins in certain fantasy settings, they do change a lot about oh, that in goblins. Fucking J.K. Rowling I... actually fucking noticed this shit. Notice the change and go with it, you bitch. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, I could go off about, about J.K. Rowling, but that's a long rant. Yeah. But I will say right now, one of my favorite trading card games, Magic the Gathering, in every different universe, I don't think they've shown goblins to be greedy. Some goblins are, you know, the goblin archetype. Yeah. But then other goblins don't exactly look like goblins if that makes sense yeah yeah they'll look a little bit like i'll give an example in one world in magic the gathering goblins look a little bit like that weird little creature from uh star wars the, the weird little bird monkey thing that was always by jabba the hut oh that fucker yeah they look a little bit like him in one universe in magic the gathering ones look like big frog people Okay. Well, they're about three feet tall. Yeah, they have a weird frog-like head and really spindly limbs. But you can still tell they're a goblin. Mm. The whole deal is they like to make things and they like to eat a lot. They're not greedy. They just like eating metal. Right. They're they're a little more like in like using terminology related to like the deadly sins. Like if traditional goblins are greedy, these are a little more gluttonous. Yeah, but it's not like a big thing to them. It's just you know, 
They look, they look a little bit like frogs. Frogs will eat any most things they put in front of them. Cool. But I am glad that so Wizards of the Coast recognized this and decided, well, why don't we just change some things to goblins so they're not the anti-Semitic trope. Mm-hmm. And actually, that's kind of a bit uh, a reason why they did a lot of changes recently with Dungeons and Dragons, because it's not just goblins uh, that have anti-Semitic themes to them, but also orcs and a lot of the nature of like the good and bad monster tropes just heavily reek of like elitism and um, ethno nationalism and shit like that and. Wizards of the Coast has wanted to, like, do away with that, and I commend them for that. And a lot of people have been getting pissed off, because it's like, because they want to go by tradition, instead of actually move with the times. I'm going to be honest. Whenever I learn something new, I try to learn a little more to adapt these changes into what I know and believe. Hey. And this is going to sound a little silly, but from just hearing about, like, different changes in fantasy settings, it's... I'm just sitting here like, I know they try to present elves as good, but honestly, it just seems like they're more fascist than anything. You're not wrong. And I'm sitting here like... A lot of the ideas, especially with the high elves, are very... are very ethno-nationalistic. What I'm about to say is going to sound incredibly fucking stupid. <laughs> Go for it. Hit me, man. Are you familiar with the Elder Scrolls franchise? Yes. If there is one thing I hate the most in the Elder Scrolls franchise, it's most of the High Elf characters. Oh, absolutely. Some of them, some of them are cool because they're not arrogant assholes who get high off the smell of their own farts. But other ones... This is gonna sound a little fucked, so please forgive me, but a lot of them... Those long-eared bananas can go fuck themselves. Mm -mm. In all seriousness... I remember playing ESO and doing the Somerset storyline. And this is... I, I really hate... I really, really hate... Uh, this is a thing that I figured out from the Elder Scrolls franchise, but you know Dark Elves? Uh, yeah. So, oh, Dark Elves specifically in their own country are very not very trusting of outsiders or people that are not a part of their uh, race. Mm -hmm. uh, up until the point where basically let's just say Morrowind is sort of like pre-Civil War southern half of North America. Oh, dang. Yeah, they they even have plantations and stuff and enslave uh, Argonians and Khajiit. You know, the lizard people and the cat people. Yeah, yeah. And they, they have a word that both means farming equipment and outsider or someone who's not welcome. Wow. The word is Enwa. You know what the part that really annoys me the most about the High Elves is? What? They have a similar word that also starts with the letter N, but it's called Nibara, and it just means outsider or someone who's not welcome. A little on the nose how they're wanting to use a word like that starting with an N. Yeah, that's what I figured out, and when I told someone about this, they're like, they didn't think this one through, did they? No, they did. They just wanted to say the, the quiet part loud. Yeah. Kind of glad that uh, some newer Elder Scrolls games, while they do deal with topics of racism, because that is a topic and the that is a theme in the Elder Scrolls uh, hmm. series, is a lot of the ten races of Tamriel sort of hate each other for various reasons, ranging yeah. from historical to... Xenophobia. Yeah. Like, humans hate elves because in before the Empire was founded, the elves sort of used humans as slaves and sacrifices to Daedra. But then you have 
elves who were mad at humans because humans from Atmora basically colonized Skyrim. Oh, wow. But it's like, it seems to me that no matter what, each race is shit in the Elder Scrolls lore. Because, mm. and I'm so confused with Elder Scrolls lore and for Skyrim in particular, because they tried to say that Atmoran settled in Skyrim peacefully until the uh, Falmer, which were the Snow Elves, attacked. Everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. But then you don't really get much of a perspective from the Falmer because now they're weird goblinoid monsters. Because when they uh, attacked the Atmoran humans, who, to be honest, most of them just left there as a civil war. And they only came back to get more people to avenge the ones who were killed by the Snow Elves, which, again, they're so vague about it, it's hard to tell which side was actually the worst one. Because we get a lot of perspective from the... at Morin's side, which became the Nords, but we don't have much records for the Snow Elves, right. so it's very sus. I mean... Also, hey, bunny. Also... With what themes that uh, Elder Scrolls tries to talk about, I feel like maybe they have the vagueness on purpose because, especially when it comes to like war in history, like it's very easy to just say, "Oh yeah, there, there's a victor, there's a loser," and like in the words of xenophobic Winston Churchill, history is written by the victors. So. Like, I feel like uh, maybe that was done on purpose to try and make pe make players realize that not everything that is written down is always going to be fact. You have to come to your own conclusions when it comes to something such as the consequences of war. So, w one thing I love how the Elder Scrolls uh, franchise, I love how they do this. Most most of the lore, while there is some things Woke that are set in stone, most of the Nap, lore so is written from the perspective of an unreliable narrator. Mm. So, usually what you learn from each game is through the perspective of the main character. So, what the main character knows, other characters might not. Huh. Also, Dagnab, why are there... S I hate living right next to a fire station. And, uh, I'll give you an example. So, apparently, in um, Elder Scrolls lore, as you know, there are various gods, just like in any other fantasy setting. Okay. But there's two kinds of gods. You have the Aedra, who are the gods who sacrifice their lives to give birth to mortals. And then there's the Daedra, who didn't sacrifice their life, retained their powers, and they uh, have more influence on the world than a bunch of dead gods. Hmm. Or, I guess, gods that usually just work the same way as, say, the interpretation of God in Christianity, who works in mysterious ways. Like, Daedra literally have an impact on the world. They have artifacts. Like, Daedra, the Daedra gods, also called Daedric princes, and I say prince, but it doesn't, gender doesn't really matter for Daedra, even if they're presented one way or the other. They're still going to be called the Daedric prince. Ah. <clears throat> they're often considered evil, and some of them? Yeah, definitely. But they're also sort of have like a hum a human aspect to them where some of them are arrogant. They have their own plans and plots, motivations, but others are also benevolent and caring and will actually do good things for their followers. Like they still while have others their own ambitions. Exactly. 
Hell, one of them is literally the Daedric Prince of Ambitions and Plots. Nice. One of these gods, these are Daedric Princes, is often considered to be the reason why there's creativity in the world, why there's music, why certain things exist. I'm not even kidding. Man is the, according to legend, he is the reason that birds exist because he got into a betting game with another Daedric Prince to see who can make the deadliest creature. This dude <laughs> made a fire-breathing, a crocodile-headed fire-breathing monster called a Daedroth. This man just came with a sparrow. And this monster killed itself trying to kill the sparrow. <laughs> that That is beautiful. That is fucking beautiful. I love it. But he also... Um... The one that makes me a little queasy is how he made music. I guess originally there wasn't music and he found this person whistling and he figured, why don't I make pleasant noises with this person's body? So you know what this- that, I know how that sounds, but what he actually did was basically turn this person into a musical instrument. I mean... Pantheon and, lore speaking, that's not as tragic. Like, it, it's, it's still, freaky. It's still kind of gross. It, 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 it is a little gross, I'm not gonna lie. But, like, I still think that, um... This isn't creating all of music per se, but this, uh, according to, like, Irish legend, um... There, uh, I forget who exactly had died, but when someone had died, um, Bridget, uh, was said to be the one to first create caning. Caning being a type of singing done as like lamenting for uh, a person. And it's a very powerful, very, very intense bardic uh, piece of music that you can do. And like Bridget was said to be the first one to create caning out of mourning during a time of war. I just... You said keening, and I immediately thought of an... <laughs> I guess you can say this is the first Adric artifact in... No, it's a Dwarven artifact in uh, Elder Scrolls. Literally called keening. Mm. It was made with another weapon called Sunder and a gauntlet called Wraithguard to interact with this thing called the Heart of Lorcan, which is literally the heart of basically the father of all gods, who literally sacrificed his body so the world could exist. Oh, wow. And his heart is a literal thing. Hmm. That it can be destroyed. It's not going to destroy the world or anything, but it can be destroyed to sort of... Well, it's a it was some weird lore thing in Morrowind where the main villain was trying to use the heart to take over the world. So destroyed it and basically weakened a very powerful godlike entity. Mm. Um, I will say one thing I do find hilarious is going back to the guy who made music and birds and stuff. His name is Shea Goreth. Hmm. Is or, there a significance um, for like what his name means? No, but he used to be a different Daedric Prince. Though I do find it funny the name they picked for what he originally was. That so, she Shagorath is the Daedric Prince of Madness. But he originally was Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Order. Oh. Here's the thing about him, though. There's two Daedric Princes of Orders, but one of them is the, considered the weakest prince, despite taking on the aspect of a dragon. What makes um, him a little special is his is more of a natural order. Like life, death, disease, that kind of thing. Right, whereas the other is more order as in, like, law? Sort of. His order is more cold and rigid. Whenever Jigalag shows up, his Daedra, called the Knights of Order, because they literally look like crystalline humanoids, Ooh. they literally suck the life out of everything their crystals grow out of. 
think of something colorful and imagine that being gray and dying. Ooh. Imagine how horrible it is. Mm. Now, the other princes were terrified of Jigalag because he was considered to have more power. So they cursed all of the Daedric princes for once in their life. Cursed Jigalag to turn into the the exact opposite of what he was, the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheagorath. But the stipulations of the curse is once every hundred, once every era, he turns back into Jigalag and destroys his own world and has to rebuild from the bottom up. Oh, that is tragic. Really is too, because even though, depending on your interpretation of this god, he could be someone you'd want to have a beer with or someone you'd be terrified of because he can go from being cheerful to threatening to strangle you with your own intestines in the, in the span of a few seconds. Sounds like how a lot of people struggle to understand Loki. I guess you could say he is kind of like Loki in a way. Well, I mean, because think about it. The, the trickster god or the quote-unquote mad god that is put to blame for a lot of atrocities that honestly other people instigated and now they want to have someone else as a cop out so what do they do they put basically the blame of the entire apocalypse and put the source of the entire apocalypse onto someone who they deem an outcast because they don't want to deal with them and they don't know how to uh help to enable their skills in a in a uh in a positive manner. I kind of wish there was some positive aspects in real life mythology like this. <laughs> like, I mean, they, like maybe, yeah, they did blame one guy, but they tried to redeem themselves and fix the problem that they ended up creating and blaming on somebody else. I wouldn't be surprised if there are or have been or had uh, aspects like that uh, in like in our mythology. We either don't know them, I, we, we most likely don't know them either because they are folk traditions that have not been contacted, and understandably so, or they've been lost to time. Damn. I mean, I guess we can try to make our own with some fantasy setting. Yeah. And or some people will have interpretations of... Uh, of like popular mythology like lokians have a lot more empathetic uh, understanding when it, well some lokians i should say have a more empathetic understanding like what i describe with relation to loki i'm not lokian uh i'm more a syncretic pagan for both norse and celt for norse and irish but yeah so I will say there is one thing, I, this is what I really loved about the Shivering Isles DLC for Oblivion. What's up? This is, and this is why I love Oblivion so much, because it's a game where, unlike other Elder Scrolls game, you're not some chosen one, or the reincarnation of a warrior god, or some... You're, 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 you're not, not, you're not like... I don't know if it went something. through. You're literally just... I will change the music. Um, Bunny, what kind of vibe do you want from the music? Also, you cut out a bit. Kenny, what did you say earlier? Yeah, like in Oblivion, you're literally just some guy who just happened to be in the right prison cell at the right time, and you are supposed to deliver an amulet to a monk and find the last surviving son of the Emperor. Uh, I also find it hilarious how the Emperor's son... The Emperor, by the way, in Oblivion, is voiced by Patrick Stewart. He's literally only in there for 10 seconds, but Patrick Stewart said that was the most fun he's ever had voice acting. Give me a hot sec. I just realized I had some text. Like... He was given a 90 page booklet just detailing this character's backstory. 
and he is only in the game for 10 minutes. Also, it's okay for me to join? Yeah, Bunny, you're okay to join. Kenny, are you okay with Bunny joining us? Yeah, sure. But, um... Yeah, the Emperor is only in for 10 minutes, and his uh, last air is literally voiced by Sean Bean. <laughs> People say that there's like only the same 10 voice actors for the Elder Scrolls games, but you, you can't say it's not a treat when you get someone famous to uh, voice important characters, no matter how short they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lives are in the game. <laughs> right. But, um... Anyway, um, Shivering Isles, basically a door pops up in Cyrodiil, and you go through it, and you're entered in the Shivering Isles. Basically, why it's there is because Sheogorath is looking for someone... He doesn't... You don't find this out until later, but Sheogorath is looking for someone to replace him. Ooh. The reason for that is because... He's slowly becoming Jigalag again, and he figures the way to break that curse is if someone was to take on his role and responsibility and slowly become him. Right, pass the baton. I will say there was quite a bit of cut content for it, and there if I were to rewrite it, I would. But it is a very amazing DLC with really rich storytelling. It explores some things where, like, if you were into psychology, you'd really be invested in even the side characters, because in the Shivering Isles, everyone is a little bit, quote-unquote, crazy. Mm. You'll have some characters that deal with serious stuff like kleptomania, addiction uh there's one character is a cat person who loves dogs and then this guy who loves dogs this other guy who loves dogs he's terrified of cats oh so you can just see like the tragic comedy of like the the kashi like going to the dog person and all of that ensuing yeah there's actually a quest where you can like convince the khajiit to either leave him alone or just to uh you know, the Khajiit person. <laughs> right. Um, I think my favorite one is there's two halves of the trial. There's a darker, more swampy half called Dementia, which represents the dark and gloomy aspect of badness, and the other half is more bright and colorful, but equally as dangerous, and it's called Mania. And they're each ruled by uh, <clears throat> uh, a duke or a duchess. So the Duke of Dementia is very paranoid and thinks someone is trying to kill her. And lo and behold, she's actually right. So you have to try to figure out who's trying to do it. Interesting. But then there's the Duke of Mania. And I'm going to be honest, I, I do not like this man. He kind of... Do I dare ask? He, he's very... I don't want to say sleazy. He's very hedonistic. Mm. Like, he loves partying and drinking and taking various illicit substances. And I, I should I should reiterate, I condone the use of drugs. Yeah. But the thing is, you have to find this thing for him that's apparently a cup that can cure addictions. Hmm. The worst part is, you have to take... At the, the quest to get it, you have to go inside a hive of these giant bug creatures called Elytra, and the only way to get in is to take a thing found in their bodies, which gives you horrendous withdrawal symptoms until you reach that cup. Yeah, so it's a very scary thing to me, because one, I hate bugs, and two, I 
have never taken drugs, but I've known people who have been in that position, and I don't want to be in the withdrawal right. stage. And it's more annoying in that um, mission because you'd be surprised how fast it takes to get like the really bad symptoms. So you have to try to hurry, oh, wow. while at the same time fighting off these bug things. Well, that sounds lovely. Yeah, but luckily you never have to go back there again, so... <laughs> well, There's the silver... But this is... Here's another thing that makes it even weirder. After helping out both of them, because Shea Groth wanted to help out both the Duke and Duchess of Mania and Dementia, he then wants you to take out one of them to t become a Duke or a Duchess of either dementia or mania. Right. <laughs> I will say right now, it, the becoming Duke of Mania is the funniest one to me. Because how you do this is you're supposed to put uh, one of his illicit substances in his food, and basically, if you, from what I found out, what that stuff does is if you take too much, your heart explodes. I'm like, well, this game got dark. I mean, it's been dark, but damn. <laughs> right, I was about to say, like, Skyrim games don't, well, Elder Scrolls games, like, don't fuck around. Yeah, you, like, on the surface, it looks like a kid-friendly thing, but then you'll have things like trolls beating people and then feeding them to Will-o'-the-Wisps, or literally, like, assassin cults and stuff that are actually morally gray when you read into it. So, I'm not going to go into the Dark Brotherhood and Oblivion because that's a whole can of worms. A lot of tragedy, but also justice. Yeah. But, um... Through, like, at the end of the Shivering Isles DLC, you literally become Shea Gorath. Like, you're, you wear his outfit, you gain his powers, but you don't, like, like look like him. You're until... Basically. But you don't become him until... So in Skyrim, there is a quest where you meet Shea Gorath, and it's heavily implied that he's the main character from Oblivion. one bit of dialogue. He mentioned that he was around the time... He basically dropped that he was around the... during the time of, uh... the, the uh, Septum uh, reign, when the family that was the uh, Emperor's family was uh, the Septums. And he remembered... a few things from a fox a severed head and a dragon. The fox being the gray fox who was the a very important character in the Thieves Guild quest line. A severed head being associated with the Dark Brotherhood because of some very dark stuff towards the end. Mm. And at the end of Oblivion, Martin Septim becomes an aspect of Akatosh, who is literally a god depicted as a dragon and like the head of the Tamrielic Pantheon. You literally see the god fight a evil god. Well. Wild. Yeah, that sounds pretty wild. But, um... Yeah. And again, I cannot... I have to say, I do not condone the use of drugs. So, kids, don't do drugs. I mean, there's no kids uh, in my streams. So, adults, don't do drugs. Yeah, drugs are bad, okay? Drugs are bad, okay? I do that too well. <laughs> yeah. I, um... 
the one thing I did love about the Elder Scrolls franchise is they explore very complex topics in a very morally gray way. Mm. I'll put it this way. We can all agree stealing is wrong. But when you deal with the Thieves Guild in Oblivion, what they do is they steal from the rich and give to the poor, like Robin Hood. Yeah. But you also see in Oblivion with the Thieves Guild how certain governmental institutions like city guards and counts and countesses and stuff, they usually, uh, under certain circumstances, they they do treat the poor very, very unfairly. Like, they'll try to, like, in one part, like, an entire section of the city is under watch, and you have to basically try to incriminate the guy who is in charge of uh, locking down that part of the city to try to get him relocated so they'll be off the Thieves' Guild's back. But the thing is, yeah, they're thieves, but they're not bad people. Right. They're usually contracted to steal from well, people that are honestly just mean to people who don't deserve it. Mm. Also, thank you, Celine, for the full care package. Care package? Yeah, full care package. Stretch, food, drink. Uh, um... I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna go get me some juice now that you mention it. Yeah. Actually, I wanna double check on my. I don't know if my. Uh, I don't know if Top Hat is home or not because I wanna see what's for dinner because I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> so I'll be back super quick, guys. Uh, I'll see y'all in a quick sec. I'm not gonna do an intermission screen because this should be really quick. Probably have like a proper dinner later, and I can probably poke Top Hat to pick up something. So, um, and then at the end of the Thieves' Gold quest line, you pull off the biggest heist of the century. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time you ever see the namesake of the Elder Scrolls franchise. You're literally stealing an Elder Scroll. Cool. Nothing wrong with Kit Kats. And it's really crazy because, like, it's this whole process where you have to activate this weird thing to stop time. You have to use these uh, special boots to um, jump down a long uh, chute into an elven ruin underneath the Imperial Tower launch a key like a literal arrowhead shaped like a key into a um, door thing and then sneak through the tower to steal an Elder Scroll and 
the reason it's so easy to steal once you're there is because everyone who is watching it are these monks who are blind. So, like, you just sit in one spot and talk to one of them, and they bring it to you. But the reason that you needed to get this Elder Scroll was to help the Grey Fox, because wh why he's called that is because of the cowl he wears, which is a Daedric artifact that hides your identity, but at the cost of your name being stricken from memory and history. The Elder Scroll in question is supposed to break that curse. So it's sort of like a fairy tale ending. Hmm. Wow. Um, then you got the Dark Brotherhood. This one's a little weird because some of the people that you assassinate as a, as a Dark Brotherhood assassin kind of have it coming. From people who do horrendous things to a pirate captain who's probably done some really bad stuff. You know, the list goes on and on. Right. But then towards the end, you sort of find out the consequences of what happens when you take out somebody. Because one person infiltrated the Dark Brotherhood specifically to dismantle it because they killed his mother right in front of him and it drove him crazy well, damn yeah the dude was basically like Jason if you if you've seen Friday the 13th part three you know why I'm saying that mm, actually I haven't so the first movie, Jason's mother was the killer. The second one, you find out Jason was alive the entire time and he wanted revenge for his mother's death. And the third one, you find out that, one, he comes back to life and he made a shrine with his mother's decapitated head on it. <laughs> Yeah, and this is one thing I find so weird about Dark Brotherhood quest lines, though. For some reason, the character you play as in the Dark Brotherhood always is someone who talks to, who's able to talk to the Night Mother, who is this spectral being who sort of gives out the Dark Brotherhood contracts. But only one person's able to talk to her, and that person is dubbed the listener. Interesting. And then there's there is a there is a weird sign that you can tell that okay, this guy's gonna become the listener for the Dark Brotherhood if you ever do a Dark Brotherhood thing. Mm, what are the tells? one of the dialogue options because in with the dark brother if you're a dark brotherhood assassin you go on a contract you can actually approach your target and like either tell them who you are or you can literally remain silent oh. hello hey, hey and it's it's like oh my god why I it's weird it's just... like what's up bunny yeah Sorry, did you say a thing? I said I am now existing. Well, nice to have you in the land of the living. Mm, thank you. I woke up from my nap like an hour ago, so... <laughs> that, that is a mood. Yes, I feel you. I had the weirdest dream. Is it friendly? Not... I do not believe so. Okay. I will tell you later. Yeah. Anyways, you were talking about Elder Scroll lore, whatever. 
talking about how weird it is how in every Dark Brotherhood quest line, the main character is the listener. No idea what that means. <laughs> the listener, like, is one of the highest ranking members of the Dark Brotherhood because they're the only one who can talk to the Night Mother. past two, three days, I had no internet. <laughs> oh no! Is everything okay? Yeah, my uncle is doing, uh, well, helping out with some of the housework by renovating our house. Mm. And he needed to cut off, cut off some power, so too much won't be going through the house. And no. so my room, the ba my bathroom, my grandma's room, the living room, and my mom's room, which is getting rejuvenated right now, is the only places that have no working plugs. Oh wow! So the only place that has working plugs is the kitchen. Yikes. And you could probably guess where my internet was supposed to be plugged in. I, I'm... I probably could, but my brain is not 100%, so you let, just lay it on me. It is the living room. Okay. And like I said, the living room had no power. And it's behind all the stuff that is that my mom took out of her room. Mm. So there's like no way to like dig it out. <laughs> Great. But yeah, for the past three days, I had no internet. I yes. had to go shut off data. Wow. I'm sorry about that, dude. Is that right? So, I have a funny story about not having internet. Go for it. Now, you're going to think I'm a little weird when I say this, but I saved some YouTube videos, specifically long playthroughs of uh, video games, onto my laptop. That, that is a mood. I don't think that's weird, because I actually saved some like long plays and like stream VODs uh, whenever I would go on flights or like large large treks that i knew that i wouldn't have internet but i wanted to like watch something gaming related or anything like that i straight up would, would save boss from like cat icarus or saber spark yeah oh, i you um... watch saber spark hell yeah i do yeah it's just like his opinions on things so like Nice, you found this weird thing that I probably would have never known until you told me about it. Mm. Yeah. It's nice fun. Yeah. <laughs> I... Oh my god, like... During the time I was, like, using up all my data... Um... I found... This, uh, this one YouTuber that had a story, like, of their D&D &D thing. Okay. And the first episode, which is, like, somewhere in the middle of their campaign, was, like, four years ago. <laughs> hmm. And it's still going on to this day. Nice. And I'm like, wow, how is this thing still going? Oh yeah, like, there there was a news article that came out recently of some dudes having a D&D campaign that's been going on for 40 years. 40? Wait. 40. So, wait. Four zero. 
from the very beginning. Yeah, nearly since D and D first came out in the 1970s. They they had this wait, start in the wait. 1980s. Oh yeah, D and D first came out in the 70s. Well, oh, hold up. First question: Are they still using first edition, or using like the most recent edition? I don't remember what they said about that. Okay. Because if they're still dedicated they're using the first edition, oh my god. That is some dedication right there if they've only used first ed. Yes. And like I heard they first ed next was edition. horrendous. Oh. Yeah, first ed is pretty bad. I, I would say... It... <laughs> Honestly, it is still worse than 3.5, as much as we love to meme on 3.5. Because 3.5, you can break so fucking easily. I'm still new to the D&D stuff, so <laughs> I have no idea what most of the stuff is. Oh, you were in for a treat. Oh, I have I have a D&D story to share to you. What you got? Oh boy, okay. So, um, and dude, I'm I'm not going to elaborate because it's not my place to tell somebody their business. Mm-hmm. I will say though, my previous DM, though he was a good DM was not a very good person so because i am someone who believes if you do bad you don't deserve nice things i stole most of his campaign stuff this was on this wasn't like here's and stuff this was just copying some hero forge figures on my hero forge account and uh stealing a map for the DD campaign hmm. i'm like i said i'm not going to say what he did but let's just say I have a lot of issues with what he did. So I stole his reaches, so I'll take you on your word. Yeah, I just up and stole his D D campaign. <laughs> In a quest for petty vengeance. Ah, the indirect way <laughs> to get revenge. Stealing. Malicious compliance? Well, not necessarily, <laughs> but it's it's the same. <laughs> yeah. I just I I really had a problem with what he did and I did not want to go off on him. No, I'm understandable. Because I'm I'm trying to control my anger. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I Although, like if it were up to me, I'd say the man deserves an ass whooping. <laughs> That's a paddling. When you said like there was a campaign that was happening for forty years, I remember. I'm not sure if it's like still like being worked on or whatever, but I remember this uh, one uh, article saying like this one person has been working on a movie, hand drawn for fifty years, wow. something like that. I need to switch up the title for it real quick. What? It's not out of this world to see someone like, hand draw stuff for a movie for so long because one of my favorite animated movies of all time, Redline, is all hand. And he cut off. Which part did I cut off? No, it's all it's all hand drawn. I think is what he said. Oh. I thought you, like, just cut off at some point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Internet's a little spotty sometimes. All good. But, yeah, um... Speaking of d and I did hear that there is a D&D movie coming out next year. Yes. Yes, there is. I love how Chris Pine is playing a bard and is, like, the leader of the group. I 
I'm really excited for it because I like even though I'm not too much big D and and like I said, starting in D and D. Yeah. I'm. I want to see like how they interpret it. Hmm. And I wonder like if the skills in like 5e or like any other editions are like put a play into like the movie. And this is just a recreation of what happened to an actual campaign in real life. I would assume that they're going to try and have some sort of bombastic um, campaign-like scenario. Because one of the big things with D&D is that you are kind of meant to feel like you are on this big, to like, depending on the kind of campaign that you have or the genre, some, like, Tolkien-esque or whatever kind of adventure. It's meant to be big, larger than life. Uh, and there's a lot of chance to a, to a lot of things with D&D because of the mechanics. So, if they're not going to be... If they're not going to reference that in some way, they're going to lose a big opportunity. So, one thing I did learn, um, some people were a little mad about one thing in the trailer, which is there is a druid character who played the uh, redhead girl from It. Okay. Um, apparently, she was able to turn into an owl bear. Some people were mad about that because apparently, owl bears aren't a type of animal. So there's no way she could wild shape into one. Yeah, technically speaking, if you were going to do that, you would need polymorph. So I'm curious That's... to see how the movie will try to explain that. Like in this run, I wouldn't be surprised if like some some DM hypothetically would combine the spell of polymorph and. And, um, I forget the name of the spell that lets you change into, like, a, a non-humanoid creature. Um, um, that's that's still polymorph, but specifically for, um, what do you call them? Specifically for, like, turning into animals, it's called wild shaping. Wild shape, thank you. Because, yeah, Wild Shape is a very specific characteristic, a uh, very feat, I should say, for druids. I forget, are druids able to get polymorph? Because I know, I know bars can get that, but that's pretty high level. I know some people would probably argue with me on this. I, I'm going to have to check the rules to double check. I feel like a druid should be able to get polymorph. Because if you can Wild Shape, that's just basically... A very limited polymorph. Yeah. Yeah. But you gotta remember, there's polymorph and there's true polymorph. Yeah. So. Polymorph, uh, if I remember right, there's like a limit. There's like a capacity on what you can do. Whereas true polymorph um, doesn't have those uh, restrictions. Yeah. And like um like I was saying, like if it this is something they just made from their mind or from an actual campaign. If it's from an actual campaign like that happened to like between some people, I really wonder if we will notice any type of quote unquote nat ones or nat twenties in the movie. Uh huh. I feel like they it's... might do it in like a similar way like how um, the folks at Critical Role have done things for Legends of Vox Machina. Like, um, for example, when Percy... When Percy's um, guns jam, um, that is actually in relation to a mechanic that Matt had for Talison when Talison was playing Percy. Because Talison was the one that was beta testing the gunslinger um, subclass for fighter since that was a uh, a borrow and like a 
a rebranding of a certain class from Pathfinder. Uh, the the caveat was that when Taliesin would roll a nat one when trying to use one of his guns, his gun would would not just jam, it would break, and he would have to spend uh, an, at least an action to attempt to fix it. And you see that mechanic still during interactions with the Percy and the others in the Vox Machina cartoon. So, I, this is going to sound a little odd, and some people might crucify me for this. Not a big fan of Critical Role? Oh, no, no, I love Critical Role. It's just I wish they would add the mechanics from Critical Role into canon D&D material. That would be nice. I feel like um, that might be treading on some not-so-great legal territory, because one of the things that helps to make Critical Role a bit unique um, is that they do have some unique aspects related to their campaigns. They're not always... Um, using direct 100% the same material as everything that Wizards of the Coast has written for D&D. That categorizes transformative content. Now, if you were to... At least this is my interpretation. I could be wrong with this. If you were to do an exact uh, campaign, one-to-one, -one, the exact same mechanics, the exact same everything that Wizards of the Coast has written... All the same characters that they give you for a, for a module, everything. That might not be transformative enough. You may still have new people playing the same characters and possibly having new perspectives on how they act. But without that, it's not going to be that transformative. It's not going to be the change that is necessary that, that counts under fair use. I just completely blanked out. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I understood what you meant. It's just, as odd as it sounds, I kind of wish they would, at least D&D 5th edition, I wish they would introduce, like, even so much as, like, a flintlock pistol as an actual weapon. Hmm. I mean, oh, because... I actually just remembered uh, a thing that kind of relates to my point. Remember Strictly how... Strictly speaking... The rules to a game are not subject to copyright in the U.S. Oh, Celine just noted that the rules to a game are not subject to copyright in the U.S. Ah, huh, good to know. Um, yeah, that's but, probably why you see some games, some board games have very similar rules. Yeah, but to go to, to kind of still uh, add to my point, um, remember how in the Vox Machina campaign from the streams. The Everlight is not called the Everlight. She is called Saren Ray. Saren Ray is a direct is a name directly taken from the Pantheon in Pathfinder. So in order to like like Critical Role, like the folks behind Critical Role, changed the name of Saren Ray and in order to, like, curb the chance of, like, uh, intellectual property stuff. Huh. That's interesting. E. So, um, if you want to hear about what my D&D &D character is... Yes. This is gonna sound a little silly. Look, I He's love a... I love me some some chaotic and silly characters from time to time. What you got? I don't I don't want to say like D and D characters can either be serious as all hell or be silly and chaotic. Look, they... Mine is a oh, human you know bard who is a part of the College of Spirits because his whole backstory is he was raised by the ghost of Jack Black, though, because this was something <laughs> written by my previous DM, I'm probably going to change some things. <laughs> because I'm he, I, I'm just... I, I I'm, love I'm, that. I, I love that. 
The ghost of Jack what? Black. That is ghost awesome. Of Jack Black. <laughs> I know, it's so- it's specifically Jack Black from Brutal Legend. Hey, yo! I have you, no idea what that means, but okay. Brutal Legend's a game where a dude is- who's basically Jack Black is transported to the land of heavy metal, where whenever he plays a guitar, magic shit happens. So, Jack Black gets Isekai. Oh. The what original kind of Isekai. Like the... <laughs> the original Isekai! <laughs> 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 no! <laughs> wait, I'm gonna, wait, I'm gonna make something even more cursed for y'all. Go ahead. Bring Jack it. Black is the reason why bards have a type. Bards have a what type? I don't know. Stereotype. Oh. Stereotype? Oh, the stereotype that bards will fuck a dragon? Uh. Wait, so really? Listen to the listen to a song from Tenacious D and presents the pick of destiny, specifically the first song called Kickapoo. Yes. Read them lyrics and tell me that ain't why somebody decided to make bards so flirty and so, <clears throat> you know. Well, they do have the like, I think like the highest persuasion of all the. Classes. Uh, charisma, I think, you're, is what you're talking Something about. Something like that. Charisma, yes. But you know what I meant. Yeah. I am going to say one thing, though. Bard is my favorite D&D class, not just because of um, adult reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because of the access to certain spells they can get. That only oh, bards... Yeah. I love the spell Vicious Mockery because I just love the idea that you can roast somebody and then theoretically Thanos snap them. Right. <laughs> I will say... Say, yes. your mother was a hamster and your father reeked of elderberries and they just fucking die. <laughs> uh, favorite dual class. Go. Dual class? Yeah. No idea. Hmm. I've never really done dual classing. I love dual classing. Frankly, I... Um... Uh, I know there are some DMs that get all pissy about dual classing. Like, I'm I'm more than fine with dual classing when I DM. Straight up, like, I have spent most of the people that I have worked with that dual class do it for thematic reasons. They do it in relation to like their character's backstory, which I think is super cool. It adds a lot of context and um, also adds like a story-based limitation to um, the character's abilities and what they can do, um, which can add for a lot of extra challenge for the player and how they have to kind of work up, work within themselves. Like, do they want to stick to uh, one thing for how they want to do things for the character, or do they want to switch things around? Uh, I will say, Ranger slash Bard. You can make friends with anyone, toss out heals, buffs, debuffs, and turn yourself into a living blender. Three. Yes. Uh, actually, I was going to say for me, uh, Celine, though that is Ranger Bard, I never quite thought of that. I might want to fuck around with that. I love Rogue Bard. Bard is the main, uh, as Rogue the primary Bard? class. Uh, yeah, Bard is the primary class, and Rogue is the secondary. Huh. Interesting. I was thinking of, like, um, like, one of the first characters I ever made. Um, well, actually, technically my second character mm -hmm. was a halfling. And you know about halflings passive of if a if a creature is one size larger than it, it could hide behind the creature? Uh, yes. I was thinking, like, if you add, if the Thiefling had, a, um, um, I forgot, Rogue, it could technically activate the sneak damage at any point. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it's actually funny how you mentioned that, um, because when Sam, uh, again, referencing Critical Role, when Sam played um, Not, um, she was a goblin, and one of, uh, like, so she was known to, like, actually, like, hide behind a lot of things, hide behind some of her allies who were more medium-sized, and so she was able to get some of those buffs. Yeah. It's just like a really neat like concept. Is that if you're rogue and able to have the ability Using to hide your allies for cover sounds very rogue. larger than you, you can technically activate sneak attack at any point. And this is it's just a neat thing that you can like completely break the game with. <laughs> right. And then if you're like a ranged attacker like an archer or a wizard, you have ranged damage that could count as sneak damage. Ooh. I think. I don't know. Because I, I uh... because I kinda wanna do go ahead. Oh yeah yeah. I was talking to myself from a hyper focus and on Skyrim. <laughs> uh, and I'm just vibing here. But anyway, like, <clears throat> like a rogue mixed with like a melee, like, like a close range wizard or sorcerer, sorcerer would be like pretty powerful. Honestly. If I were going to do rogue, I'd go rogue slash sorcerer with illusions. Set up a 5 tall wall illusion with minor illusion and anything on the other side that fails a save gets your sneak attack and is flat footed. Ooh, that's actually a good combo. Celine said if I were going to do rogue, I'd do rogue sorcerer with illusions. Set up a 5 foot tall wall with uh, illusion with minor illusion and anything on the other side that fails a save gets your sneak attack and is flat footed. Hey yo! That's, That's smart. Scary, That's <laughs> smart. Alright, y'all, I have to put together an eruption vampire mm. costume for tomorrow, so <gasps> good night. Ooh. Popping in real quick to remind everyone that you're all amazing people, adorable beans, and a bunch of cuties. Good luck, Melissa. KK, that sounds like a sleep well and have fun playing a sucker. Oh, you have fun with your costume. Egyptian. I really wish I could make costumes. Also, thank you so much, uh, Zelda. <laughs> Egyptian vampire, that sounds interesting. Wait a minute. Egyptian <laughs> vampire. Zelda, the same Compared applies to, to you. Eruption Once vampire. over for each person you said that to. Well, okay. That, that, there's, just there's, a jo there's a JoJo reference in there. But I, I didn't want to bring it up. I don't think Melissa knows JoJo. Literally, part three ends up from Japan LOL, to Egypt, to and the main bad guy Kristen is a vampire. Is having a ball and we all got identities. <laughs> hey, yo, awesome. Tell Kristen I said, the, tell Kristen Ooh. and the folks that I said hi, by the way. Hope y'all break all the legs. Sorry, Melissa in training oh, no, is a friend of mine in real life. Mad. I got slapped by an ad. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Break a leg applies equally well to bards and right. rogues. <laughs> but anyways, um, <laughs> back to like D and D stuff. Oh. So, you know, I just thought of an idea for a bard, but then I just realized, can't bards cast illusions Fighters too? Fighters usually take a different meaning, but still applicable. Do they? Uh, uh, no, I'm asking, can they do that? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Can bards cast illusions? Because I know they're a little limited on certain spells. Uh... Bards can cast some illusions, but they need to sing for it. Oh, Celine does make a point. Bards can cast some illusions, but they need to sing for it. So theoretically, I could Ooh. bard playing the lute, and it can cast spells. I, I would assume so, yeah. because similar to, like, how <laughs> druids have, like, their druidic focus, um, bards have to rely on 
their standing and their instrumentation and such. And their okay. charisma hat. Yeah. So... Because I thought of uh, doing a bard with some critical role aspects to it. Ooh. Namely a bard that uses pistols. So I, I can... Bard fighter, and you can be a gunslinger. Also, Selene! Hello. And if you wanted to be a um, bard who uses pistols, all you'd really need is a feat that specifically gives you proficiency in firearms. Ooh, so, realistically, um, if you're using Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I think it is, uh, there is a firearms proficiency feat. And uh, that one, I don't think it has any prerequisites. But, yes, your uh, loot would be used as your primary focus, and you have to play it in order to make spells as hard. Sorry, I've been a dungeon master for a decade and change now, so I, I My goodness. know a few rules, Dang. mostly from 3rd and 5th editions. I, I was thinking, like, when he said, like, a bard with, like, a flintlock pistol or whatever kind of range weapon, I was just thinking... <laughs> Back in like 2010s, when people were like, like when COD was like very popular, people were making like music with all the different gun noises. <laughs> oh yeah, using like the weapon itself so, as a form of uh, music, so it becomes a focus. Yeah, right? like you spin the <laughs> cylinder, yeah, tap it at thinking. the right time, kind flip of it over, it like and slap it your hand. Yeah, it's a percussion <laughs> instrument. That's that's what I was thinking because like, all, like you're just like this is a battle happening, and all you see is just, this player just playing with their gun, <laughs> and then suddenly a giant fireball erupts from it, or your wounds feel better. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that sounds amazing. God, I love those kind of stupid ideas. <laughs> well, but that's just it. I mean, at the heart of Dungeons & Dragons, uh, Gary Gygax was originally trying to create a game where everybody could play the same sorts of imaginative, make-believe games that they played as little kids, while also being able to have some rules in place so that there weren't fistfights over whether or not the wizard could burn down the lich's castle before it noticed. Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, the imaginative and creative elements that go beyond what Wizards of the Coast provides as base rules are actually what make the game fun in many cases. Um, and if you've got a really good storyteller as your DM, it can make for a much better experience. But not everybody is like super into the storytelling aspect. Some people are very in the World of Warcraft vein of, we want to see things burn. We want to, you know, go up against dragons and punch them in the face and have it look awesome. But yeah. we don't want to think beyond Indeed. that uh, being able to punch dragons and gods in the face. And so um, for those players, there is a need for those additional rules and those additional books. It, it's so varied. But I love that tabletop role-playing games speak to everybody in that way. Mm. Anyway, sorry, I, I didn't mean to, like, totally take over this. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's okay. Also, hello. This is, like, like, interesting. Hello. I, um... You want to hear uh, one thing I do, I did really like about... Before I found out the previous DM I had was not a good person. What? One mm -hmm. thing, I did like how he did, like, some of the things he did with, uh everyone's character he all uh worked with every player to just, like work on like their ambitions and what they know versus what everyone else knows oh yeah and a few mechanics with them like for me because i really like the idea of vicious mockery i asked him is there a way i say insults to uh better interpret what my character is saying to the uh insult another player with vicious or not not a player another character with vicious mockery and he said i'll tell you what you, if you come up with a good insult that is specific to that enemy i will have it deal double damage but if it's something weak like your mom sucks 
it'll do it'll go with disadvantage. And I kind of really like that, especially considering my bard had a uh, was psychic. Oh, I would take that a step further. Mm. If you toss out a really weak insult, your opponent gets a chance to come back. So if my mom sucks, well, yours is the one that swallows. Oh, damn. <laughs> I like you already. Yeah, like, 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 that's the thing. Like, like, giving the player, like, describing what they do before allowing the role to happen. Like, it's scary, but also makes the player think more carefully of what their action is going to be. Oh, absolutely. One thing about being a DM, and this is coming from someone that hasn't DM'd all too long, but from my experience, like, while, while at the heart of D&D, it is a collaborative effort between the DM and their party, at the same time, like, D&D is mutual storytelling. And you, as the DM, are the one that initiates the storytelling. You're the one that gives the core details and everyone else, akin to improv, introduces and, and continues with many yes ands. And he has to continue with those yes ands in order to like keep everything going. Yeah, and I love that you brought up improv because improv doesn't just help with your DMing. Although it certainly does help. Oh, there. it also helps um, when, when you're a player, too. Absolutely. Well, it also helps with... Yeah, I'm just skills. assuming, like... Yeah, I'm ahead, just sorry. assuming, like, improv is, like, the main thing that happens in DM. Because, like, despite, like, planning all the stuff, learning, like, the story and all these things, like, you have to, un you have to expect the unexpected. Mm. And you have to improv that idea that happens like one of the uh D&D stories i was listening to like D&D stories i listened to um one of your players is cursed with wild magic Ooh. and uh, yeah basically they're cursed with wild magic with a certain percentage and it will slowly go up over time Ooh. and I remember one of the wild magics, like literally in the first part of like the story thing. Um, the wild magic happens, and it makes I believe they said a a hundred foot radius um, of um what's it called? It's like it's like anti magic thing, mm. and because of that. The rods around the city was keeping a, I think, a giraffe under the city. <laughs> and because of that, the giraffe came out and started ter ter terrorizing the city. <laughs> oh. So I'm like, how is this story going to work? Because, like, they said, like, the character was, like, level 5, level 4. And, as you know, like, just giraffing is, like, CR, like, 100 or something. Mm. Wait, isn't a Tarask basically a giant dinosaur that's supposed to be a sign of the end times? Um, yes. So are you talking in mythology or in Dungeons and Dragons terms? In Dungeons and Dragons terms. Dungeons and Dragons terms, it is just a singularly nasty critter. Um, the way that this one works is it's got a lot of hit points, a lot of ways to kill you. It is very, very big, very, very hard to get through its hide. And even once you drop it to zero hit points, it doesn't stay dead without some of the endgame magic to keep it dead. Yeah, because it just becomes unconscious or something like that. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually die becomes dormant for a few hours to a few days, and then it gets back up and continues where it left off, possibly a little bit angrier than before. I can't dog down, but I can up again. You're never gonna keep me down. <laughs> that was only my first phase. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't even my final form. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> I haven't even begun to use a fraction of my power on you, you mere mortal. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Dragon imagine ball is such a imagine trick. if a terrorist that is able to talk actually said that shit. Oh, a talking terrasque? Well, if you've got a druid or a ranger in your party, you can understand it. The creature is considered a beast in third edition. It has sufficient intelligence to have its own language and to understand language. Is does if it's sentient, doesn't that mean you can also convince it to say, "Hey, please don't destroy this town?" Um hypothetically, but you're talking about an always evil creature. There is only one of it in existence. And you would have to figure out some way to reason with such a creature that has no real motivation to stop doing everything it normally does. <laughs> it, it's listen, kind of the listen, same if a, bard can, if a bard can lay a dragon, I'm sure it could convince a Tarask not to destroy its head. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> my logic. Back in here. <laughs> oh my. You have seen the dragons have no reason to lay the bards. It certainly doesn't create an <laughs> army of affectionate individuals. You might just yeah. decide that maybe the treasure hoard doesn't need to be stolen. Or at least that's not the primary objective. Oh my. <laughs> I can trust. Trust. <sighs> eh, not so interested. <laughs> <laughs> Probably doesn't even have the equipment for it because there is only one in existence at any given time, ever. They don't reproduce. They're they're just there. That that is fair. So, well, gone it. Kind of like like rolling up an improv uh, one shot with the three of you at this rate. Oh, please, 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 please! I have a character that I've been wanting to use for a long time. Oh, for goodness' sake! Can <laughs> 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 you take me up on that? <laughs> All right, so um, um look, there was how, given how well of a storyteller and how compelling you are as a person, Celine. Like I am beyond excited to 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 see your DM skills. <sighs> All right. Um, okay. Well, you are currently. Let's see. How far into this are you? Looks uh, like you've still got three and a half hours. Away in. Getting close to well, three and a half hours. No, I more meant in terms of overall progress. I don't want to distract you from your artwork here. Uh, I'm, I would say this is like three-fourths. Okay, yeah, you, you've still got some more coloring and shading to do, though. So, um, while Rode finishes out the artwork on this, why don't you two tell me about your characters? Or if you don't have some, let's come up with some. So... I do have like a base concept of my character but no like story connected to it excellent that's my favorite place to start hey, it's always uh it's always really good to like have a character that doesn't have it, it's kind of a stereotype but it's not a bad stereotype for like uh a character to be able to have like this bombastic story of like oh um i'm like related to like royalty or like running away from home all this kind of stuff there's nothing wrong with that but it makes yeah, it all the more fun for the player and the dm for the character to be a little aimless yeah i was like the kind of the best thing about it is so like during like the storytelling you can add more info about your character that you haven't planned for yet. Yeah. Or what I like to do is I like to create foundations for like my character's stories when I'm a player. And I like to give my DM the reins so that they can give me some plot twists so that I can continue with that yes and. Yes ands are incredibly important and like, I am usually like pretty open for like that for my DMs to create twists um, in like a CNC kind of way because with that like they already know like my boundaries of what I would prefer for the character story and such so there's very little risk of like anything having to be retconned and there's a level of 
more realistic suspense for me because I don't know what the twist is going to be. I don't know what's going to come out, so I have a more realistic feeling. So it really makes me able to get into the emotional context of the dilemma that my character will have to face. Yeah. So, uh, I was talking about my uh, D&D character from the last campaign I was in. Mm -hmm. Before I left because... DM wasn't a nice person. Not necessarily wasn't a nice person, just did some very bad things. He was nice enough, but that does just because someone's nice doesn't mean they're a good person. Right. And, you know, I have a very... This may sound weird coming from someone with a moral compass that's a roulette wheel sometimes, but I do have a very strict moral alignment. Mm -hmm. Realistically, yep, chaotic good. <laughs> Just like my I, D. I, I, sometimes I think I could consider it as chaotic good, but it feels like I'm more closer to either neutral uh, good or just um, chaotic neutral. Mm. What about you, Celine? What would you consider yourself? Oh, I'm probably either lawful good or lawful neutral, depending on how you define good. I've known some people who view my adherence to a certain uh, rules and restrictions within society as an inherently evil act. Other people just see it as me trying to do the best that I can within the legal framework that I'm given and treat it as good, so... Um, but it varies from person to person's perspective, and I want to be able to respect that even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Yeah, yeah. The So, I've always found the alignment chart in D&D fascinating. Because I feel like players should be able to make certain decisions. Even if it goes like against like the chaotic and lawful side of uh, what they do. Like, I feel like you should have a chaotic good player who will still follow the law if it lines up with their uh, moral beliefs. Yeah, I used to have, for my first few campaigns, I used to have a custom alignment system that was not necessarily about like good evil neutral whatever i more focused on like it was able to be translated into um lawful neutral chaotic uh, all that jazz um but it was related to if i remember right it was uh wanderlust uh compliance um endurance, um, morale, um, I, I would have to remember what they are, or I might just have to recreate it, but it was five attributes with five levels of severity, with each, um, but when you are on either end of the spectrum, it would tend to say, like, different things and put you at different risks as a character. So, like, say, for example, if you had a high wanderlust, I remember wanderlust was one of mine. If you had a high wanderlust, you are more easy to get distracted, and thus, if you uh, arguably are more likely to let your guard be down, because you are so encaptured by things around you, um, and you want to travel and such, that you, you don't really focus on your own guard. That, that kind of thing. Hmm. Coming that from a DM's sense. experience, actually, Celine, what do you think of that? Um, I mean, assigning different characteristics in terms of, like, odd personality traits based upon an alignment, it's an option. Um, and I, I could see some players working well with that and some players gaming that either specifically to cause havoc within the group or uh but one of the big tricks with that kind of thing it works well with cooperative games mm. so if everybody is expected to kind of play nice together 
but not every campaign that you run is going to have cooperative players. Yeah. Um, in the same way that you'll sometimes get rules players and you'll sometimes get people who uh, really prefer the rule of cool to any uh, rule within a book, you'll also get some players who just deliberately want to make other players miserable. Um, most often these are people who are playing evil characters of some stripe. Um, but at the end of the day, the uh, I would say that's one that can work, but needs to be applied judiciously. Mm. Um, and so it, it's because I could easily see a character deliberately like going out of their way to make sure that other characters are distracted and then using that moment to pick their pocket and then persuading the character through sheer charisma on the player part. Mm. Uh, that, you know, oh yeah, but your character is this distracted, so I've now got the artifact MacGuffin, but nobody else knows it. Mm. It's... Eh. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Uh... Tradition, like originally, like I don't want to use it so rigidly, like it's a like like it's a horoscope or like a Satu Um It was it's it, it's still like obviously like in in beta, but it's it's meant to give more of an idea, not like a like a hard default, like how traditional is for the alignment system in D and D want to implement. Yeah, and I mean, even within D&D, &D, the alignment system is actually something that if you're using correctly, uh, can draw a nice character conflict. You know, the, the trolley problem is something so commonly used for lawful characters, as an example. Um, yeah. I, like, for those not already familiar with the trolley problem, you have one person tied to a trolley track. And you can flip a switch and move it so that a different person or group of people will be run over by this trolley instead. And it, like, there are entire libraries of papers written about this subject of is it more moral to flip the switch or not flip the switch? Um, and is in doing nothing a way to avoid culpability for it? So to put a lawful character into a place where the law and what is good are in conflict, you can actually create really nice dilemmas for a well-played character. Mm. Um, but that falls apart when you have someone who's more of like a min-maxer or a munchkin um, in your campaign, because they'll pick whatever is going to give their character the best benefit with the justification of my character needs to be this strong in order to you know, stop the big bad and control the universe. And if we have to break a few things along the way, that's not my character being a jerk. It's my character accepting that duty and placing it as part of that for the good of the world. You know, there, there's a lot of ways to hand wave those things as well. It just depends on who's there. Right. A and unfortunately, that is so much of uh, what the indie system is. Uh, it it's... I like it as an introductory system because it has rules for almost everything. But it, there are a lot of systems out there. Um, I'm particularly fond of like the Werewolf, the uh, or Werewolf the Apocalypse or Vampire the Masquerade or two that I, uh, I was introduced to a while back, and they place a much heavier emphasis on the role playing aspect. Um, so in a lot of cases, you would roll just like four or five different d10s and if more evens than odds showed it happens otherwise it doesn't um and that same principle of just does it happen or not can be a very interesting question that uh it, you can actually take a step back from all of the hard rules on it at that point and focus on the character development and their interactions mm. Um, and actually one that I've been hoping to play for a little while now, and I just can't get enough people to sit down in one place to do it, is uh, Lasers and Feelings, which the entire rules system fits on a single uh, A4 piece of paper. It, it is a role-playing system fully fleshed out in a single sheet. And uh, the characters take on the roles from... Uh, basically any arbitrary science fiction uh, genre. 
So if you want to have Captain Malcolm alongside uh, Lieutenant Spock, and uh, they're all going off to some grand adventure in, uh, you know, whatever the Battlestar Galactica universe is, you can totally do that. Um, and the characters are just, you have one number. The dice system is you roll a six-sided dice one, two, or three times. That reminds um, so... me a little bit of uh, Honey Heist, which is uh, what originally made to be like your, your sentient bears like doing uh, an espionage style heist of trying to get a shit ton of honey. It's a very similar uh, layout to where it's like you use only one D6. Hey cuties. Lexi! How's it going, hon? Hello, Lexi. It's good to see you. Hi, Lexi. How do you think the artwork is shaping up, dearie? Yeah, let me show... There we go. <laughs> um, I have a couple other things about my previous D&D character, if anyone wants to hear. Go for it. Um, the Doing funniest well. aspect Just of my character him. is he sleeps Happy with his shirt off y'all. and his chest OMG, hair is shaved into his initials. Amazing. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> the reason Locked for in that it. is in case he fights a changeling and a changeling changes into him, it'll be easier for someone he trusts to figure out which one's the changeling. Because the person he, he anyone he trusts the most will know he changes he shaves his chest hair into initials GG for Galen Goldenheart. <sighs> so literally they'll be like, I don't know which one to shoot. Take off your shirt. What? <laughs> Both of you take off your shirt. Alright. It's hard to top that. Was that a pun? Hmm. Yeah, I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel for them though. Oh, it was good. But um, the other thing with him is, and this is going to sound really silly because the inspiration for how my D&D character fought came from a Call of Duty video Yay. <laughs> called the, the uh, it was called, no, no, the, not, it, he doesn't fight with like rifles or anything. The video was called the Call of the Akimbo Magnus. Listening to two convos, but I'm happy to <laughs> so see do, you all He do well build the pistols. <laughs> So you're thinking your current character? I mean, current Sorry, character may not be as silly as a cowboy bard, <laughs> but maybe like, have one. Maybe have bard. one. Yeah, but we couldn't figure out how to implement dual building with pistols in the game, so we kind of had to bullshit it. Well, the pistols are light, one-handed weapons you'd have the same penalties for fighting with two weapons that you'd normally have. Uh, which, unless you're something like a ranger or a fighter that specializes in two weapons, usually means that you have a, what is it, minus four on your main attack, and it's either minus six or minus eight with your offhand attack. Um, the actual act of attacking with it, you get your normal number of attacks with either, you can uh, pick which weapon you're using, so if you have an ice pistol and a fire pistol, you can fire the fire pistol. Uh, and you have two attacks per action. Fire the fire pistol twice, fire the fire and the ice pistol once, or fire the ice pistol twice. Um, but then you also can take a bonus action and get an additional attack with uh, the weapon that you're not using as your primary. Um, so if you've mostly been firing off fire rounds, you would have to have at least one ice round mixed in there. Uh, in order to use the bonus action as an offhand attack. Um, but yeah, but I'm fairly familiar with the dual uh, wield rules because I usually play a character who has a pair of either daggers or hatchets. And uh, rangers are really awesome for that. They, they turn into freaking blunders so quickly by like third level. <laughs> they, they are dominating until wizards start getting the AoE effect. I remember the, this, uh, I forgot, I forgot what it is, but I, because like, every now and then when looking through like YouTube shorts and stuff, I'll just come across like one or two D&D &D, like, people, they'll make broken, like broken ideas that could possibly work if it's done correctly. 
Okay. There's one for level one, level three, level five. And some of them are even like dual classing. Or even that to work. Oh, yeah. I mean, dual classing is very common uh, if you're trying to do something more interesting than just like play your run of the mill bard. Yeah. I've also uh, thought of a few ideas for some unique uh, D&D characters. I just haven't figured out story or names. Okay. Thought of an well, Oathbreaker. I thought of an Oathbreaker Paladin where, you know, the whole thing with Oathbreaker Paladins where they break their oaths and their alignment completely changes? Yeah. Thought of an idea where, what if there was a Paladin who was devoted, who's a oath was to somebody, but that somebody did something irredeemable and thus that paladin broke that oath like would he still be considered he or she still be considered uh, an oath evil? breaker would he it still depends be on the system um so in third edition which that's what we're going to go with here because or initially third edition paladins had to be lawful good um, so if you were beholden to a lord who was committing evil acts and you could not find a way to reconcile those evil acts with, you know, legitimate authority and the order of the world, essentially, it would be part of your obligation to overthrow that ruler. Failing to do so would be an evil act and would cost you your paladinhood. Um, whereas in like fifth edition, when they've done away with that particular restriction, Gur, by the way, not happy about that. That's not how a paladin works. Um, but yeah, you could have your devotion to either um, an order that turns out to be absolutely terrible or have been tricked into doing something and you would still be breaking your oath by overthrowing this person or uh, getting rid of them. In terms of game mechanics for what happens then, well, that's an interesting question. I, as a DM, would probably say, rather than treating this as you're an Oathbreaker, I would treat it as you're a paladin of something like Redemption, um, which allows you that piece of, hey, I too have been a great sinner, not through intents of terrible malice, but through circumstance. And I would like to extend that forgiveness to others kind of thing. Um, there are other ways to do it, and I think it depends on the backstory that you're fully going for. Um, so I'd be curious to hear what you're thinking you'd like to do with that, if that's something that you want to play. So my idea was a paladin who was devoted to working for a lord, but turned out that lord was someone evil, be it like some kind of lich who sacrificed innocent men, women, and children to... Turns out the uh, god you were working for it was actually really, really evil. So instead of... I still like the idea of the Oathbreaker Paladin because technically Oathbreakers are stronger than normal Paladins, but instead of being evil, he's more chaotic good because I like the idea of using something evil ultimately for good. Think of, um, I, for a comic book example, if you've ever heard of the Darkness, the entity that controls the main character is really evil, but he becomes a, use, uses it to do good things and protect the innocent and kill really horrible people. Yeah, or like a John Constantine kind of thing, if we want to go a little closer to uh, the DC Comics universe in that regard. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would almost propose a warlock or something to that effect at that point, rather than... Uh, taking on the Oathbreaker Paladin fruit. Um, but... That's, uh, I had an idea for a warlock too, but I would get to that <laughs> one in a minute. Sure. Um, so the warlock I had an idea was... Because I was asking about, all right, so what do warlocks do? Because I know the... T from a joking standpoint, people say warlocks are magic sugar babies. <laughs> Why not have a warlock who is sort of like a bard, but has like a more deeper, intimate connection with their patron? It, it's an option. Those are some really strong power dynamics. Um, I would 
say that's something you really want to make sure your group is comfortable with first. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's some pull out your X card and be sure that there's uh, some rules in place. Wait, what's um, the pull out your X card? I'm sorry? I've never heard that term before. What is pull oh, out your X card? Um, so the X card is one of a set of safety tools that can be used for tabletop role playing games. Um, Specifically, the way it works is you set this card with an X on it in the middle of the table. And uh, if somebody is in a place where the conversation's shifting into a trigger or a trauma zone, um, for my part, domestic abuse is something that I, I, I mean, I would have a really hard time uh, dealing with a game where those topics come up. If a character has a history with a parent and certain words or phrases that are common in domestic abuse situations comes up and I need to kind of push the scene into a different place or we need to uh, skip over a scene where somebody is dealing with a very particular kind of person, um, what I would do is I'd just reach out and tap the X card. And this applies to everybody at the table. If there's something you need to move on from, if we need to just get out of this scene, tap the X card and everybody just kind of... You might have to describe a little bit about what's causing the issue in the first place so the DM can steer away from it in the future. Um, But it allows everything to move on without having to get into the nitty gritty or without having any fights about hey no this is just getting to the good part uh because not everybody's going to be able to do that yeah absolutely um Um, so if if, at least from my perspective if you're talking about a patron who has that kind of at least from the way you were phrasing it it sounded like it might be a more uh amorous connection to their people um that's something to talk over with your DM beforehand and make sure there are safety rules in place for it. It's not a bad thing, and it's not something that, uh, like, I-, I could see some campaigns really benefiting from that. It's not a bad idea. But it's also one of those places where safety comes into play. Yeah. Um, and actually, that, that does remind me of yeah. something that I was recommended uh, by some of my former players. Um I like to use, so I've never, I never heard the expression, uh, pull up the X card until now. Um, <laughs> but it reminded me of a, uh, a PDF file that, uh, one of my former players gave me that gives like a list of various, uh, content and trigger warnings, such as like things related to domestic abuse and all that jazz and allowing each player individually, anonymously or otherwise to list uh, their comfort with uh, different topics within a tabletop campaign. Because you can have either a green light, a yellow light, or a red light, similar to the stoplight system in BDSM. And anything that is yellow light or red light, you... Yellow is okay as long as there's like confirmation, and red is obviously a no-go. Yeah, and that's part of uh, what would be called the safety toolkit. Um, and that applies okay. for other activities beyond okay. tabletop okay. games. Okay. Um, and okay. that's those are a very good thing to look into, to be aware of as a DM. Um, and as a player, I mean, I know some people come into the game with a very textbook mentality. Um, and you'll often hear them called rules lawyers. For some of them, it's not always obvious why something like that would be necessary. Um, so it can be a little bit of a trick as a DM to communicate to some of your players, hey, these are places where we need these additional bits in place, even though they're not part of any traditional rule set. Um, I believe there are actually a few rule systems as well that incorporate those kinds of tools as part of the role playing experience. Um, So, like, some core rulebooks will have safety tools built into them to allow that stuff to move forward. Um, It's been a little while since I read through. I do think I recall seeing Thirsty Sword lesbians having that particular uh, rule inside of it as well. Yeah, I remember actually my friend uh, Melissa, who was in chat with us uh, a little bit ago, she actually has a copy of Thirsty Sword lesbians. 
And I need to meet this person. <laughs> Sorry, go on. You will, you will love them. I swear <laughs> to all that is holy, you will love them. Thirsty sword lesbians. Yes, it's a role-playing game system where you take characters who would fit in inside of like a um, pop culture, science fiction, or fantasy universe and give them swords and send them out into the world to go topple over uh, the patriarchy and show that the world actually is a better place while also getting a chance to experience some of these characters' uh, romances in a homoerotic sense that you can't normally see within media. So think your she and Katra type things. Yes. Or your, and uh, rather than being about trying to, you know, stab the big bad, it's actually a system around emotional injury and toxic behaviors and recovery from those toxic behaviors. Um, so in a lot of ways, your character is encouraged to uh, uh, avoid trying to step on people's feelings, but also show what happens when these uh, feelings manifest, how they affect the party dynamics, and treats uh, taking care of your comrades' ability to function as people as a more serious thing than, you know, a flesh wound or losing an arm from some kind of giant laser beam. Um, it, it, it's, it actually includes a lot of really cool stuff. Mm. Uh, it, just, it just reminded me, like, when you oh, said a flesh wound or, like, breaking off an entire arm. I just thought it's just, just, just a flesh wound. Oh, God. <laughs> It's just a scratch. It's <laughs> only a flesh wound. A flesh wound? Your arm is off. No, it isn't. <laughs> How about I you? I love that so much. <laughs> um, I didn't really think about power dynamic when thinking of that uh, warlock, but now that you mentioned it, I did want to explore one thing that I thought would be interesting in a character like that. The patron wants to know what it's like to be more human, whereas the warlock mainly wants power. Not in an evil sense, but just to, to have power to... So, what is it to like to flex your finger and have a mountain move? It's or what kinds of amazing things... It sounds like. Yeah. This also, this may sound a little controversial, but does anyone ever seen or read the manga and anime Bleach. I know bits. I have it. heard of it many times, but never read or, or watched it. I have so seen for, the first two seasons. So for a good... I've, I've seen a lot of it, if you want, if you want me a nerd about it. But uh, for a good... <laughs> the main character is dealing with sort of an inner demon, or in the case of Bleach, an inner hollow, who... Claims he's the claims his name is the same as his sword because in Bleach everyone's sword has a spirit inside of it. Mm -hmm. Like Ichigo um, or something? No, no. The main character is Ichigo. His sword is called Zangetsu. Oh, but uh, okay. <laughs> but Zangetsu has two spirits in it. One of which I can't say because spoilers. But the other one is like Ichigo's inner hollow. I would argue mm. Ichigo is sort of like a warlock fighter in that aspect. Because whenever he um, dons his hollow mask, he's sort of drawing that power from his inner hollow to be stronger. Hmm. But it's a little odd because after a certain point, he doesn't use the hollow mask anymore. Yeah, I would have thought of Ichigo as being more of like a Kensei, which is uh, one of the specializations of fighter. And uh, so his particular weapon, Zangetsu, uh, in its basic form is a broken hilt for most of the story. Um, and it's not until later on, spoilers I guess for Bleach, that he figures out how to turn it into a full blade again. Um, but the uh, so for the character, I would treat the uh, visored mask as more of like a uh, either an artifact that is sentient or cursed in some ways. And so it can affect a person's alignment or ability to make certain decisions. Um, and there are different rules we can use in order to implement something like that. 
Um, but then that item becomes either, uh, you know, uncursed as he figures out ways to circumvent those problems or, uh, you know, even as just something that he no longer needs to use because he's found more powerful ways to deal with enemies. Um, and I, I think that's probably the way I'd look at it because the warlock's features are not so uh, direct combat. Like, getting bonuses to your ability. I guess maybe a haste or something like that could be used. But generally speaking, it's not magic so much that he's using as it is he just becomes raw power and speed and, you know, gets better at stabbing things. If I'm remembering right. Yeah. See, now um, that you mention I... it, he is the only soul reaper in the entire show who cannot use keto. Which was the magic system in Bleach. Yeah. He has unparalleled raw power. It's just he's like Kenpachi in that it's mostly used in physical strength. Mm -hmm. It's all about bonking uh, people and cutting trees in half with a single stroke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you said haste, it just reminded me of this one story that somebody was sharing. Uh, um... Um... Like, they were at the big, the big bad, and one of the players, like, persuaded the uh, big bad to be on his side. Player be on his side, and player uses haste on the big bad. And then, on purpose, cancels the concentration because of the haste debuff. Oh. So... The player will constantly will haste the big bad and then instantly get rid of the concentration. So for most of the battle, or if not the entirety of the battle, the big bad is just down for most of the battle and can't do anything. Well dang. Yeah, it's it, there was a lot of creative drawbacks to the magic system, especially in first and second edition. Uh, haste used to take literal years off of your life. Like your character's lifespan would be shortened by a few minutes to a few days every time you used it. Wow. Um, yeah, well, it turns out Gary Gygax did not like wizards as a class. So in the original uh, Dungeons and Dragons, they had a four-sided hit die. And the uh, armor that they were allowed to use was basically nothing, or else they straight up could not access their magical powers. So wizards, until they get to be mid-levels, are basically just squishy. And uh, if you're the DM, uh, you, you can usually figure out ways to eat something squishy in you know one or two hits. I mean... Yeah. Is that why the like... wizard stereotype of getting one shot at exists? I was oh yes, they... big time. And I mean, he... wizards are still yes, pretty squishy, I... in my opinion. Wizards have a six-sided yeah, like, hit die <laughs> now and are allowed to wear some basic armor. And there are magical spells to increase your armor class. Uh, no, the the there's a huge difference there, unfortunately. There there is a difference, but I do still think they are pretty squishy still. I'm I'm thinking like a really risky way to play wizard or like sorcerer mm -hmm. is like what I said like earlier trying to make them into like a close range magic user. There are a lot of ways to do that. Some of them are multi-classing. Some of them use feats. Some of them just you like, pick the right spells and you time your approach to everything very carefully. Um, I've seen some really nasty melee wizards, and uh, the best counter I've seen to that is basically having the monsters focus the spellcaster first. Um, yeah. And I, I did play with a DM who was very prone to targeting the highest DPS output character first in combat, usually using things like restraint or uh, spells that require a save that the character is particularly bad with. So my character was high dexterity, low strength. And doggone it, every time we'd get into combat, somebody would come up from behind and grapple me. 
and ignoring the implications of him having every encounter start with me getting grabs, because uh, that wasn't really where his head was going. Um, it, it also gets to be a very frustrating way for players to experience stuff. Uh, so yeah, like, having flaws for your character can be good, but as a DM, be sure not to exploit that too hard, or it will just get tiring for your character. Yeah, that's why... Yeah, because, like, like in... Sorry. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you sure? Yeah, sure. Okay. But from from my experience, again, coming from someone that's still a bit of a baby DM, when I do encounters, I like to have encounters that are... I like to do everything thematically. So when it comes to, like, especially, like, what are... The, the Them's cute like the stockings. Battle, um, I like to focus on... I still like to treat my my monsters or whoever the uh, party is going against like they are people they still have their own motivations even if they are not what we what we consider the most sapient they still have their own motivations so how do their motivations drive them where do where and who will they strike first that's what i do hmm like um, I've been taught, like, in one of those random shorts I found on the D&D shorts, is that yeah, most enemies, like, because of, like, most enemies don't have, like, a lot of, not a lot of knowledge mm. about said players, the enemies will usually attack, like, the closest target. Yeah. And either, like, as the battle goes on, the enemy will start learning the player's composition or smarter enemies will like quote unquote scan the players and almost recognize what each player's role is because like one of the biggest examples are well the dragons or wyverns mm. since they are mostly smart creatures they know who to target first to reduce the amount of damage and support the players will do. Mm. Yeah, it's, it, there are a lot of ways to make the encounters feel a little more natural. And it always frustrates me when people are like, no, the bruisers are supposed to go after the barbarians. Like, they see that barbarian knocking people down left and right and figure maybe getting an opening by targeting the squishy person who's trying to throw a lightning bolt uh, is the smarter option. That one I don't yeah. really mind so much. Mm. Uh, and that, that that's just yeah, good storytelling like, right there. Yeah. yeah. Because, like, either the enemies start learning via, like, uh, the duration of battle... Or some kind of, like, leader watching the players, like, like learning how the players are working together. So, Rode, I, yeah. I apologize for this. If this is out of line, feel free to tell me. No, you're good. I'm looking at the picture on the stream and almost wondering if, like, uh, you could give her some kind of a glow or corona around uh, the back of her image there just to give it a little more mystical pop rather than looking uh paper like yeah i can add but so I it, actually, that's <laughs> i actually already add had uh an opacity a thing like behind her or well i the layer was turned off now i have it turned back on i have it turned back on uh does that help out um it's I... more it's it's a gaussian uh based on her silhouette are you wanting more like a more proper halo? I mean, I was thinking something that looks a bit more like a. Uh, it's like switching up the color on that. I, I was actually looking at this at low resolution too, so that's yeah. my bad. Uh, bumping up the resolution, I see what you've done there, and yeah, I don't think it would work with this. It would require you to basically pick one end of the Gaussian and switch it over to white instead of uh, black or something like that. Mm. But. Honestly, I think what you've done there is probably not going to be enhanced by it, so never mind. Hmm. Yeah, Lexi, if you're still in chat, what do you think, hon? It's 
the one poker. <laughs> hmm, but how do we poke <laughs> Lexi? I mean, she's in her server. Oh, By yelling nice. poke. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, that sounds like a terrible idea. Yelling poke at Lexi? Um, hmm. Nah, Let's you see know here. what would probably get her? Uh, By the way, um, I found out the name of the movie from like two hours ago. <laughs> oh. I'm just gonna drop into Lexi's uh, server real quick. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So the movie is called The Overcoat. Mm -hmm. It's being made by a Russian director and animator called Yuri uh, Norstein. And it stays on here. It's been in the project since 1981. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm closing the bag of Kit Kats. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Looks like I also need to have, like, an actual proper fucking food. I'm probably just gonna make, like, chicken, uh, chicken patties or something. Or ramen. Ramen might be good. Got a lot of ramen. Ramen has so much salt. <laughs> it does have a lot of salt. But if you use like half the packet, you still get a good bit of flavor, but you don't have to worry about as much salt. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, like, when Selene was like, hmm. um, setting up the offer of doing a D&D &D with all three of us, Mm -hmm. I want to do that. I mean, for me, it just depends on the time. Yeah, for me, it would depend on the time as well, but I I would love to get back into the D&D. Like I said, I do have a character that I have been wanting to use for a while, and I would love to find a DM who would love to uh, work with her. There she is! There's Hello, the sexy enough. lady! Yee! How we doing? Doing good. Are you looking at stream right now? I am... I am multitasking right now. My sister is doing a cosplay stream that I have redeemed, and I'm jumping... Oh, oh. fucking god, this looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get your tits right this time? Oh. <laughs> yes, you got my tits correct. <laughs> Holy shit, it only took how many times. <laughs> I love how like that's the first question. No, you did not understand, buddy. Priority. I, I did not draw tits right. Like, I, whenever I draw someone who is well endowed, I cannot get their tits right. <laughs> I think it's also because you mentioned before you don't like to make Booba too big because you 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 would like to focus more so on the character and the personality. And I understand that you yeah, are trying, yeah. you're very you're very respectful to everyone that you draw. But I'm also kind of like, bruh, I am also big titty G goth GF, so <laughs> it, it is part of my, the tits are part of my personality. <laughs> okay, fair. I'll be sure to remember that. <laughs> this looks amazing, by the way. I'm so in love with it. Yes! Do you want me to add anything for the background, or do you think this is good? Let me check. Um, sorry commercial break so it's like everything kind of like zoomed in oh, you're so good. oh no you got swept up by the ad Shit. yes i yes i did see saline came to summon me <laughs> i uh i didn't realize i thought she was coming back so i didn't say bye so now i feel like an asshole oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. i mean you did you know, the, um, I will say right now you did miss a couple of things, uh, namely me talking about my previous D&D character, who I will probably be refurbishing for a different campaign. And me also Please. talking shit about my current work. That's just how but, it is, though. We always we all talk shit about uh, what the streamers. <laughs> yeah, I, I just came into the stream and like they were talking about like Skyrim lore or something. Mm -hmm. Siren lore? We're talking about Siren Cell? Like, El like, um... Oh. Yeah. Okay, Elder Skyrim. Scrolls. Oh, okay. So, two hours ago. <laughs> I'm over here, like, I'm over here just went, oh, I thought we were talking about Simon's. Anyway, <laughs> um, no, this looks amazing. Um, I want to say the only thing I would add is possibly some red tips to the hair. Red tips to the hair? Uh-huh. Yeah. Actually. Like, like uh, a gradient. Yeah. 
there is like a small bit of a gradient on your bangs. Oh, I see it. I see that. Very nice. Yeah. And actually, I'm I say get rid of that stray outline there. What were you gonna say, hun? I was gonna say maybe just on the other two bangs on the side. Oh, okay. Not mm -hmm. a problem. Awesome. This looks amazing. Y'all, you're doing... I can't wait to show this to Babe. Alice is gonna freak out when she sees this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna be... I've been getting a lot of commission work and fan art this month, so I'm gonna be doing a big debut of, like, all the artwork I got this month. I think next weekend. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I'll make sure to include this one for that. Oh my god, there we go. Um, oh my god, yes. Oh my god, this worked out. But yeah, I hope your stream has been going well. Sorry, I am like being pulled in several di directions right now. You're good. Um, I'm, I've been lurking here. Um, I had to talk to Bark about a video edit, and then that became a chat. And then right now my sister is doing... I redeemed 50,000 channel points on my sister's channel. Mm -hmm. So she's doing a cosplay stream right now. So nice. I've I have been summoned by, uh, by, by my big sister to possibly be part of the TFT, hey and I'm yo. like, if she's summoning me, I must I must go. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, her cosplay yeah. looks amazing and stuff, and I might have to reinstall League just so I can play TFT. <laughs> I was in such a healthy relationship, everyone. I broke it off with League, and now I'm having to go back. You you left. <laughs> oh no, the addiction is coming back. Fortnite. What do you have to say for yourself? Wait, one more time. You left League. You had a healthy relationship with League, and you went to Fortnite. How honey, do you there feel? was no honey. There was nothing healthy about my relationship with League. Let's get that straight, okay? <laughs> there, was, there was nothing healthy about our relationship with League. Listen, listen. Occasionally, we need each other. I see, I see Riot. I'm sorry. I see League uh, uh, release some new skins, and I feel the need to cosplay or draw the characters. But I also don't want to be a poser. So now I have to go back to League, play a few rounds to show I'm not a poser. I'm not a poser. See, I know the characters. I play the game, and then after that, I can go back to drawing, and then not talk about it again for a few months until another season of skins get released. <laughs> but anyway sorry um this looks amazing road the hair is perfect i do need to go for now because i'm being summoned yeah yeah all right and yeah. actually i yeah, think be where i'm going to stop stream because i do have stuff going on right mm -hmm. after um so let's get a raid going unless anyone wants to redeem past the baton which i did Ooh. Um, That's the time. Yeah, well, I did decrease the price recently. Looking for it. Looking yeah, for SDS it. Five K. Yeah, it used to be ten K. It's five K. Okay, yeah, one sec. Yeah, I have Boy six picked. point five K. Got right. it. Just redeemed. All right, sexy. Who you wanting us to raid out to? I, you said sexy. I wasn't sure you meant Lexi or sexy. I approve. Uh, sexy just drop the link. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be. Um, I would like to redeem a a raid over to Kaylin to Angels and Sirens. They are a they are a cosplay couple. Kaylin cosplayer Kaylin Siren, as well as Cage Angel cosplay. They recently they recently merged their channels together to make things a bit easier, more sustainable for their craft. Um, I redeemed 50,000 channel points on their channel, and Holy now shit. they're, oh my and now, God. so they're doing a cosplay stream. This is my big sister and her husband, nice. and they are currently dressed as Yor and Lloyd from Spy Family, because that's what I asked them to do. Nice. I, I just started watching cool. Spy Family today. Mm. Hell yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I didn't think here. I would like it, but I was wrong such a good show all right well since we are finishing up let's get that raid going and let me switch things back up over to my little chat screen so thanks everyone so much for tuning in and hopping in on stream be sure to hop in tomorrow because since we got to over 100 followers now on twitch 
I'm Yay! Gonna be talking to my lord tomorrow, not next week. So, I'm hyped. Oh, neat. Yeah. All right. So let's get those messages going. Thanks so much to everyone that's hopped in. Lytriol, thanks so much for the uh, for the raid earlier, which. Which, before we stop, let's actually get, uh, if I can remember how to spell your flippin' name right. Um. <laughs> Lytreal, Lytreal. Fuck. Electrolyte. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, where are you? L yeah, okay. Lytreal Tempest, here we go. A quick shout out to you. Thanks to everyone that has hopped in. Uh, Celine, hey, we are getting to a raid. We're going to be raiding out oh, hey, Siren. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We are almost out of time. Uh, be sure to come in tomorrow when we're going to have the lore dump. Uh, do know that um, this may be the end of stream, but it's not the end because the road to dusk is always open for a new adventure. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Have a good time zone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Panic. Panic screams. Panic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the people are rated.